Let's do this. Foul Territory live on a Tuesday. Braun, Kratz, Krasinski, and Jason Kipnis is back. Wearing the ASU shirt. I think that is perfectly planned for your former sure coach was. coming on soon. Got to. Absolutely represented today. We are well represented here. Yes. Pat Murphy is joining us, bench coach for the Milwaukee Brewers for a while now and quite the character. So I think you'll enjoy it. Also, Zach Buchanan of The Athletic to talk about the sizzling diamondbacks and he's got a story that he put out in the last 24 hours about madison bumgarner who was let go by arizona he's got more insight there pretty pretty spicy and then gavin sheets white Sox slugger joining us to give away the clank ball it's over right that's here that's it say bye kiss it goodbye goodbye clank no, ball no, i want to keep you forever <laughs> signed by pierzynski and lance lane if you've been snoozing, you can enter the giveaway, but you're running out of time as we'll announce a winner in, I don't know, like an hour from now. So yeah, we hurry also, up. You got like 25 minutes. Yeah. So make it snappy. Also, just I haven't said it in a little bit, but merch, foulterritoryshop.com if you want to check that out. And I didn't get to this yesterday. I want to try and make this more of a regular thing because you're hitting ballparks almost every week. The food stuff is one thing. You can check AJ's Twitter, but you got a little run in with, Spencer Strider and Rick Kranitz. <laughs> <laughs> well, run-in wasn't exactly the I word know. I would use, but uh, yeah, if you guys, if, I know Kratz knows this, but Kip, I've been trying to, to get the, everyone talks about Strider and how his stuff is just different, right? Like, it's just different. So I was like, screw this, I want to stand in when he throws a bullpen. And so this week I was in Atlanta, and guess who was throwing a bullpen? Spencer <laughs> Strider. Guess who didn't get to step in, though? Me. Damn it. Uh, they let me watch his bullpen from behind, and uh, I was—I mean, I was two feet away from him, and he was throwing cheese. How's the fastball look? Because that's—that's I mean, that's what this led to. <laughs> yes. So is uh, it different? It, it sounded different coming out of his hand. Does it look different? I don't know. You can't tell unless you actually get in there. But I asked him. I said, "Can I stand in next time?" He said, "Sure. Just make sure you're wearing protection." <laughs> and I said, "Okay." And I said, "A lot of people threw at me and hit me. I'll be okay." <laughs> and then so we went down and asked Snit afterwards. And Snit said, I said, hey, can I stand up for Strider's bullpen if next time I do a game, he's throwing. He goes, yeah, as long as it's okay, I tell him to hit you. And I was like, I would expect nothing less. <laughs> so, you know, Spencer, I'm coming for you. Do it. Do it. I need to do say it. that. Yeah. And when you do that, when you do that, I'm going to get a video back in the day of somebody standing in against one of Roy Halladay's bullpens. Famous, famous fisherman, if you know your fisherman. But anyway... Anyway, once you do it, I'll, I'll release the video, and the video is epic. You won't even believe what happened, but it's a teaser. Wow, that is an ultimate teaser. Yeah, well, I mean, now we want to see the right video. Since yeah, exactly. The chances of it happening, of it lining up is going to be tough. Interns behind the scenes are Fox will do. Right Fox now. will do Braves games all the time. Yeah, the Braves games are fine. It's, a, it's Can I get Spencer Strider to be throwing a bullpen the day I'm there? Do you still have your big elbow guard that you would stick out there when it's 0-2 bases loaded in a 9-2 game? <laughs> no, I don't think I do, actually. You, don't, you didn't keep that? No. I well, used the same one for so many years, I think it rotted. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get Tyrus on it. They'll send us something. So before we get into Charge the Mound, I want to clap back at a fan base. And also, I'd like Kip to congratulate um, Mets fans for being a part of Getting this team going a little bit. Way to go, right? Mets fans. We did it. We we <laughs> rallied. We're the reason they turned this thing around. Uh, it's weird that there's uh, some blame and other stuff to go around when you're losing, and there's some credit to go around when the team is winning, and they have turned it around. They are playing great. They're playing awesome right now. Good yes. job, Mets fans. We did it. Great job. Together. You, you, you together. can check out the, the tweets. You guys together. <laughs> just back and forth, being friends, motivating <laughs> yeah. the squad. Because you know, yeah. Kip, like when you played – all you did, right, was sit on social media and be like, oh, this, this fan base is pissed or calling me out or, or whatever, so I'm going to play better now. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, we, didn't, we didn't think we had to play well until someone called us out. That's what really motivated <laughs> us to start playing better. We just were waiting for someone to 
uh, MF us on Twitter or online. I think that's and it finally happened. So we did it, guys. Good job, guys everyone. Good baseball. Good yeah. job, everyone. Cheers. <laughs> uh, I, I who's also, your who's your fan base? Well, so and, and sarcasm, okay, for for New York Post or anyone that quotes us all the time. So my fan base that motivates me to be a better broadcaster because clearly, I, you know, I don't watch games. I'm not very enthusiastic. I don't really like to talk about baseball. The Angels fan base. I only set up the question yesterday, and we do talk about the Angels quite a bit. They happen to have, what, two of the best players in the biz. And Cody Decker was on with us yesterday, and and he dunked on the organization pretty well, just saying, like, it's going to be a rough Yeah, he went Vince Carter and dunked all over him. Yeah, he did. But I thought it was the kind of rant that would rally Angels fans, but most of them are super defensive about the team, and they absolutely went after him last night and I was texting with him afterward cracking up because all he did was say like hey this team's got to like put up or shut up go all in at the trade deadline he throws a name out there Tim Anderson and that was it that set them off how dare you they're like Tim Anderson's not good have you heard of Neto you haven't even watched any games the rookie who's been in the leagues for five seconds also as if you can't acquire Anderson and put one at second and one at short and they're like all we need is like maybe a six starter and maybe a reliever I'm like (laughs) <laughs> These people are delirious. Maybe and also, Chris, why maybe are you Chris defending? Why are you defending your ownership and your team? You've done nothing for ten years. You haven't made the playoffs since Mike Trout was a baby. H- how are they this this pissed off at somebody who is a an actual Angels fan and was telling us that it's been a lot of heartbreak for him? Right? I mean, Zach Neto. Yeah, he looks like he's going to be a good player. His OPS is in the 600s. Like, relax. They're acting like the dude is, is <laughs> the second coming of Trout right now. I I was just having an absolute time. He's a 689 OPS. Jury is a 717 OPS, and they're like, ah, see, picked the wrong day to do that. What? You won two one on a bullpen day against the Red Sox. I just, <laughs> I was dying. So here's what you guys need to understand. You guys need you and Kip. You guys need to be more like me and just not say anything. And that way, no fans ever get on you. Just sit there. And fans just, get on you. You just don't respond. I just don't give a shit. I don't give a shit either. <laughs> I don't give a shit at all. I think this. The for me, like I mean, people come after me all the time on socials, and the sensitivity level of an Angels fan to be so heavily backing your team and defending what the roster looks like. Do you really think the current roster is going to win a World Series? I'll take an Angels fan over the sensitivity of a New Yorker on Twitter. Uh, Yeah, that was surprising to me, too, for a Mets fan. Like, same thing, you know, and I grew up in the area, and when I was younger, I was a Mets fan. And, I mean, same thing on their end. Like, relax a little bit. This is not the best team in baseball right now, you know? Hey, you guys got them hot, though. Could be. Got the roster. Could just be. Just think at the end of they the year. They could be. Angels, no. <laughs> just think at the Correct. end of the year, though, if the Mets go on to win the World Series, we can point back at this moment mm-hmm. and say, Jason Kipnis and Mets fans got him going. Yes. That's what it'll be, right? Yeah, it'll be, be acceptance. Kipnis speech. will be riding down. I'll be in the parade. Fifth Avenue in the parade holding the commissioner's trophy over his head, proud. <laughs> we'll have the make glasses it, make it on. One, make, it, make it one block before a beer bottle gets thrown in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Give, him <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give him the mic. Give him the mic. It'll be like, Mets fans, we did it. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Thank you for your support. (laughs) What a fucking run, guys. Uh, Phillies fans are good, though. Kratzy, how are they? Oh, man, they are. One one thing that's great about Phillies fans, on on, uh, especially on talk radio, is they call in and they've traded everybody on the team and they've – broken the team down three times already this year. Bryce Harper, they traded him for just to get rid of his salary so he's not what they called an albatross on the team. Kyle Schwarber, nobody cares that he had 50 million home runs last year. It is Philly fans. Philly fans are very, very fickle when it comes to their team. But I think it was John Cruck that said it. He said, I'm quoting John Cruck, so we're really going deep on the show today. He said, nobody boos louder than Philly fans, but nobody cheers louder than them, too. So Philly fans are unbelievably passionate in both ways for their team. On that note, let's charge the damn mound. Presented by Tyrus Baseball, let's get into Braves fans and Dodger fans to an extent. 
So the Freddie Freeman Revenge Tour 2.0 still exists uh, a year after dealing with coming back and the tears and all of that. Now he just comes back and rakes. Well, so, he faced Charlie Morton. What was he, six for 12 with two homers, two doubles? We were all over that yesterday. Actually, Cody was. That Cody was. A good was. Call we by we Cody. followed it, though. Yeah. Plus he, 500 for a homer. And he homered. Big three-run homer, 8-6 yeah. win. J.D. Martinez actually technically stole the show. Four hits, two homers. But the Braves have lost seven of 11. The Dodgers continue to play really well despite, you know, not having a Dodger offseason and also – Pitching wise, as we spoke to Max Muncie about yesterday, they're down quite a few pitchers right now and they just keep chugging along. Well, that's the thing for me with the Braves. Their pitching is banged up. They're starting pitching. I know they threw Morton, he pitched okay, mm-hmm. but Freed's out. Soroka hasn't come back. Kyle Wright's out. It, it's like a, a, a mash unit of starters. And it, it, when I did the game on Saturday, they used a bullpen day and they've done that. Like they're trying to do bullpen days like two out of five days in the rotation. And good teams don't do that. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the Braves. If they, if they get their guys back, they go out and make a move. Uh, but the Dodgers, man, they just keep plugging away. It's amazing. No matter who they put in the lineup or who they put on the mound, they just plug away. So, Kratz, did you see Marcel Azuna's backswing smash Will Smith? And then Will was like, dude, enough. You've done this before. You remember the guys. Like, anybody gets hit in the head, next time you bang your head on a cabinet, like, think about how you feel, and then think about it being a bat when you're trying to do something at an elite level. Like, it just is, it's infuriating when you get hit on the head. Yes, you know, it looked like he kind of looked back and, like, felt bad. He does always do it. He is, I mean, he has a long, long backswing. I don't know if he ever got me in the head. But I remember he got me in the in the forearm. But there's other guys that do it too. The story the story that comes to my mind is when I was playing with the Brewers, and we were playing the Cubs, and Javi Baez was he was notorious for it. And I think it was Jolice Chassin was pitching, and he got to three zero, and he turns turns around, he turns back, and he goes, "Hey, he goes, move back a little bit. I'm going <laughs> to swing really hard right here." And I'm like, what? It was 3-0, and he, was, he told me he was going to hack, and he was afraid he was going to hit me. Sure enough, he hacked, came back, struck him out, but oh my gosh. I've never been warned I was going to get hit in the middle of an at-bat. Wow. kind of pr- appreciate the heads up, though. Absolutely. And that he's going to be swinging 3-0. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you go 3-0 slide piece, a little cutter? For 100%. Shishu? Yeah, good, good call. So my my backswing story is I got I went from the White Sox to the Rangers in 2013. Alexi Ramirez was notorious for smacking the catcher when he finished. So in spring training we're playing him and he hits me, and I I grab his bat and I hand it to him. I said, "If you fucking do that again, I'm gonna break your bat over my knee. Don't hit me with your bat again." He never came close again. So don't tell me you can't control it. I told him, I said, you do this, I'm going to break it over my knee right here, and I'm going to hand it to you in two pieces. Don't hit me again. Did he say sorry? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but I'm like, I know you can control it, so stop. And he never came close to hitting me again. So then what's the deal with Azuna? I don't know. He's Maybe a re- no one's ever offender. Repeat offender. No one's ever said to him, break your bat over my Someone knee. Someone just did now. Will Smith was like, dude, enough. Yep, and he didn't hit him again. Right. So that was the warning, the public warning. Once yeah. is an accident or something like that, but he said it was fifth time or something that he's been hit by him. That's I think he was quoted listen, saying he, it's like his fifth time. He, yep. he, he ain't doing it on purpose, but you can, no, cut, no. you can cut it off, right? Like sure. you don't have to finish all the way to where you hit a guy. I mean, you can you can cut it off as a, as a player. Plus, if you're a catcher, it might help you out down the road where the guy's thinking about his backswing instead of hitting the ball. Right. So there's games. And, and those two could be meeting up in – the playoffs at some point. Plus, as Kratz said, that stuff hurts, man. I don't care. You got a helmet on. That stuff hurts. <gasps> Whack. <gasps> That's it why you got to point the bat point the bat at them, clear some space before the pitch even comes. <laughs> <laughs> Give you let them know. Zone. Yeah. Hey, let's let's move to Seattle. So, I mean, they destroyed the A's. No surprise there. But Luis Castillo picks up his 1,000th career strikeout, six shutout innings for him. And I just think the larger 
AL West conversation. And hey, Angels fans were pissed about this too because Cody Decker was giving the Mariners a little love yesterday and we posted that and they're like, oh, Mariners, like Angels fans are laughing at Mariners fans right now. So yeah, I'm on fire today. But uh, for Seattle, I mean, I think this is a team that's underperformed, but I think definitely a playoff relevant team and Castillo, obviously, in that rotation, among many other very effective starters that could be top of the rotation guys, Logan Gilbert, George Kirby, and the offense hasn't really gotten going. And then I mean, a good cure is taking on the Oakland A's. Kellenic had a big day. And Julio Rodriguez has been kind of quiet this year, he's too. Been, he's been down. Yeah. He's down. What's up with him? Man, I, I, mean, I had their game on Saturday, and he talked to everybody, talked to Scott Service, and they're like, oh, he's close. He's close. But what I what I gathered is, and, and Kip and, and Kratzy, I think you, you, know, you guys would understand this. Not Scott, because he didn't play. He doesn't understand this. I don't know shit. <laughs> so, so when you're Julio Rodriguez, how many times have you seen a guy come up and they're a superstar or they everyone thinks they're going to be a superstar and they had their great first year he won rookie of the year and he signed a huge contract and he was the face of seattle baseball and then you go into that offseason and you say i'm not going to change but you change because it's just human nature and then the second year is a struggle at least to start because there's pressure there's expectations there's all these things and you have so many obligations to do Every commercial you turn on for Major League Baseball, guess who's in it? Julio Rodriguez. So there's it changes you. And I don't care. You can be the greatest person in the world. You're going to change. And I think he's got caught up in that a little bit. He's still taking walks. He's still got some homers. He's, he's hitting like 210-ish around there. Yeah, so he's not – his OPS is down. It's just not the same Julio, free-loving, fun, just go play. And I think he gets caught up with people. And, and I think Julio is in the middle of it right now. I think the game, the game kind of adjusts to you and then you kind of have to adjust back to the game. Also, I think what didn't change was maybe his off season after a good year, he probably went into that off season trying to get better. And then after the good year, he went into the off season, just trying to do the same thing. I think each off season, you have to keep trying to push yourself to get better. Not kind of just recreate what you just did that last year. Like, Oh, it worked. I don't want to change a thing. No, you, what worked was you pushing yourself to get the best out of you. And I think, you keep that as your offseason goal. That's how you keep pushing yourself to be better. I don't know how to be as good as Julio, but I know the fact that he's freaking 22 years old still. Yeah. And I think we've put like guys, like AJ said, that guys are that are on like covers of things and commercials and everywhere. We put those guys on this lofty pedestal of, well, he's just going to go out and do it. He's just going to go out and have an 830 OPS again. He's going to go out and play gold glove center field. Like, he's still making adjustments. Like, from 21 to 22, I grew another inch. Like, th- th- these guys are – he is super young. Like, in no way should anybody be worried about this guy. But I think he's got to find his new norm. Like AJ said, like, you don't want to change. You have to change. Way more is expected of you before you were a top prospect. Maybe Jonathan Mayo and J.J. Cooper were talking about you and interviewing you. Maybe the Mariners were like, oh, we can't wait. Come to our Winterfest. Now he's the headliner of the Winterfest. Now he's got six reporters at his – well, maybe not in Seattle, but six reporters at his, at his locker when they come in to you know, play New York. There's, there's just more on. So to say, oh, I don't want to change – you have to change. You got to adapt. And I mean, he's young. No, no, he is. But just think about what's been put on him at 22 years old. Mm-hmm. There's very few guys, Bryce Harper, Trout, that handle it and keep. Even Harper had some. Don't forget, Harper, Harper had, had some, had some down, yeah. right? Yeah. Trout's probably the only guy. Even look at Trout, Soto. Soto Trout got some sent down. down, didn't he? Yeah, when yeah. he first came up. Is, but then, yeah. First year. Yeah. But but mm-hmm. but Soto's had some down. He's young, right? Mm-hmm. 24? Yep. So it's it's really hard <laughs> to jump in at 22 years old. And, again, tops. I've seen tops commercials. I've seen fantasy commercials. You yes. see Major League Baseball commercials. Uh, I think there's a Dairy Queen commercial. There's all these commercials. Yeah. He's, he's and he's everywhere. Pigs. Yep. And so now, guess what? He's thinking, i got to live up to this. And he – he will over time, but right now he's thinking, gosh, I got to do more than what I did. <laughs> no, just to go try to do the same thing. And to Kip's point, you don't have to 
yeah, you, you work on things to get better and better and better. But what he was doing, you do the same stuff, but because your offseason becomes so much more than just about getting focused on trying to make the team and just trying to help them win, all of a sudden you're like, man, I'm a star. I got to make this person happy and this person happy when you're not focused on yourself. And that's where it catches up. And you get older, you learn to say no, and you learn to, to do things differently. But, man, he's young for yeah. all this stuff to be thrown on him. Yeah. And they've given him a pretty good team. Support wise, especially, but he doesn't feel wise. that he because feels he's the like one doing on the him. commercials. Yeah, he's the one with all the attention. Mm-hmm. Also, I will say this because I I really like him and his hit tool. Ty France has struggled. True, that's a guy who he's got two last homers. year was all star caliber. Two, he had two on quarter. Saturday. Right, you're saying two total. He had two on Saturday when I, we did. I the understand, game. but his he had twenty some last year. His numbers since like June of last year, a couple people posted it are, are not great. So just throwing that out there too. Um, but he has Kelnick. Kelnick's killing Kelnick it. Kelnick is killing it. Yeah. And he had a big it. game yesterday. Yeah. So it, no, I, I think, and, and Teoscar Hernandez was a nice pickup in the off season and, and he's generally he's a streaky. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he's a streaky hitter, you know, he's going to have like that big. Gino Suarez is not having a great year. Here. Although he did smash a ball on Saturday. Ma- Matthew. He's slow. Julio um, tweeted this out of two days ago. Ty France since last June, 241 average, 303 on base, 384 slug. That's not Ty France, or at least not I hope it's what not. I expect. I hope it's not. I hope right. it's not. So He's there, better than that. There's some underperforming going on there. Well, my, hey. thing would, my thing would be, who do they have? who do they have that Julio can be like, hey, how did you go through this? Or like somebody that can come up to him and be like, oh, I, I went through this when I was a – Superstar. I'm not saying I'm not saying those people are just plethora. You're just picking them off the minor league heap to give them a job. But like a coach, a somebody, like how was it to be the superstar, the face? You know, here's can, the thing: can Griffey help him? Uh, Griffey's not around. Cameron, Mike Cameron was there on Saturday helping him. Maybe he's a guy. Uh, but they don't have. If you look at their coaching staff, they don't have like a real veteran guy. A name. They have guys that obviously have been around, but they don't have that name guy. Um, I guess Colton Wong would be maybe the one veteran guy they have on their team that, but he's lost his job to Caballero at second base. Um, JP Crawford, maybe when, with his Philly time. Uh, but nobody else they really have is that true veteran presence that can say, man, I went through something like this. Mm-hmm. I mean, Griffey never struggled. It's Griffey going to tell him. <laughs> Griffey's sure. like, turn your head around backward and hit homers. I'm sure you had a, you know, a bad month here and there. <laughs> All right, find one. <laughs> yeah, right, find one later in his career. Late, well, yeah, but not at 21 years old. No, no. he was coming up hitting back-to-back dingers with his dad. Yeah, that's not a great example to turn to. No, I, maybe Cameron. Mike Cameron's around. He's a really good yeah. dude. Mm-hmm. He helps him. That's true. All right, one more before we get to Gavin Sheets. So, did you see what Andrew McCutcheon said about the way that the bases are being blocked? So he said he thinks infielders are actually blocking the bag with their bodies more often and that I'll give you the quote. He goes, it's inevitable that someone is going to get hurt. And this was in the athletic Rob beer temple did a great job. Kutch goes on to say, the only thing we can do is slide cleats first and possibly injure the fielder or injure both of us. If MLB is all about preventing injuries, like they do at the plate with the catcher, why isn't there a rule that says if you're receiving the ball on a steal attempt, you can't block the base. And then later said, it seems like something really bad has to happen before a real change that makes perfect sense, can take place. Well, that always goes to – there's a couple theories here. First off, one of my favorites, very reactive league, not a proactive league. And then, Kratz, we've talked about this with a few different hosts that have rotated through this show saying, well, just slide feet first. But Kutch is kind of going back against that being like, yeah, I can even get hurt doing that. Yeah, they both can. I mean, he didn't just say, well, I can still get hurt doing that. He's just, he's saying they can get hurt. The mm-hmm. fielder, middle infielders like Kip can get hurt. I, unfortunately, I think this would be more of Kip's area. Like as far as the catcher go, like I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get any advantage I can. And if, if my shortstop or second baseman is okay, putting a knee down there to block it and maybe getting a cleat in it, I'm fine with it because I mean, dudes are just they're running all over the place right now. So there's need something to stop them. 
I think until it gets really called, they're going to keep doing it too. I mean, they're going to try to get the out. They're going to get in front of the bag. Um, but there's cause and effect. If you start going in, like we talked about this before the show, if you go in with your spikes and get them one time, they might stop doing that. I don't know if it needs to be policed as much or a rule change, but guys, guys are just trying to get to the out and they, they know how to live in that kind of gray area of the rules. Um, so they'll time it well. They're good enough athletes up the middle. They'll time it well to kind of get that body in front of the back to where you're going to have to go around. And because of that, you're going to be out and you can't really swim with all the time. And the only way to kind of counter that is maybe going in feet first, which also is a slower method than the head first slide, I think going into second. Um, so it's hard. It's hard to really police that because guys aren't going to stop it until it's called. But there are ways where the game can kind of manage itself and police itself. And I think a, a cleat first spike, I'm not advocating for something like that, but there are ways to get guys to change. Well, there's two ways. One, you catch a guy doing it, you drill him. Say, hey, don't drop your knee. Or two, you go cleat first. The problem is everyone wears plastics now. A lot of guys wear plastic spikes, so they're they're the guys like okay, I might get a little 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 sore there, but go on with some metal spikes into someone's knee or into someone's shin. Guess what they're doing next time? They ain't putting their knee down. So, I mean, as much as we want to say that, and I'm not advocating again for anybody to get hurt, but you knew though. We used to know. All right, this guy drops his knee, slide feet first. And guess what? The dude stopped putting his knee down there when we play him. So you need more enforcers. I don't know about more, it. More Ty, just... more Ty Cobbs sharpening their cleats. Yeah, there you go. Take, <laughs> take out the little file. And... Did you wear metals or uh, plastics? Both I, you guys. I wore plastics. I wore metal. I never. wore metals. I could never wear plastics. I felt like I was sliding. Wow. Well, if you're not fast, you can wear plastic. <laughs> <laughs> what are the pros and cons? Well, I wore plastic because my feet. Um, my, my feet were... Uh, when I was young, I, I, I slid, I wore metal when I first came up and I slid and I caught the bottom spike on uh, first base. I slid into first feet first because it was a close play and I, and I hurt my ankle. So I was like, I'm not wearing those anymore. And then Nike made cleats that were so damn comfortable with mm. plastics. It was like, like slippers. Why would I go to, why would I wear back metal where my, the ball on my feet, you're squatting on for four hours like this and it's digging right into the ball of your foot. Why would I wear that when I have this nice cushy plastic spike? And I was like, I was stealing bases or running around fast. New Balance made really comfortable cleats that helped your feet. Not, not just, I wasn't just selling out for the money like AJ was for the, <laughs> Nike, for the Nike contract. <laughs> but I could never wear, I, I wore plastics one time. And it was in a spring training game. I'm like, oh, everybody says your feet are comfortable. I never had any problem with my feet. I ran, I hit a double. And I remember thinking on the way to second base, I'm like, I'm never taking plastics off again. I'm never taking moldeds off. I go to stop on second base. It wasn't even like it wasn't even a play. It was just a stop on second base. Stepped on top, slid off the back, rolled my ankle. Never wearing plastics again. Because <laughs> you're unathletic. I, I'm not yeah. denying that. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, worth the discussion, though. I mean, yeah, the league did make adjustments. To home plate, to second base. Second base. They won't. Man, the good old days. They won't do it. Hmm. Cutch is right. They won't do it until someone gets hurt. Yeah. And then they'll do it. But it's got to be. It's got to be someone big, though. It can't just be. Yep. Really? So, if an unknown or lesser known player, <clears throat> like absolutely gets shredded from something, you don't think that it warrants enough attention? It'll no. take that Buster side. Posey. That Buster yeah. Posey. Mm -hmm. Buster Posey got hurt. They changed the rule. Mm -hmm. yep. Ruben Tejada got hurt for the Mets. For the Mets in a playoff game. Oh, here we go. With your, in a your, playoff you have game. so much New York bias. Uh, big stage. He knows where the money is. <laughs> you think you think that didn't matter? If, and, if Ruben Tejada played, And who else was if involved? Ruben Teja, Chase Utley. Right, that's a big But game. if Ruben Tejada played for the... What was this? This was 2016. Let's say the... The Braves, the team I was on, they lost 100 games. Think they would have cared? They'd be like, yeah, get out of the way, dude. But because it was a playoff game, because he played for the Mets, Chase Sutley with the Dodgers, breaks Terry his leg Collins. on national television, guess what? We're changing the rule. Mm -hmm. Buster Posey breaks his ankle. Think if, think if Eric Kratz gets run over at home plate by Scott Cousins, they change the rule? They're like, hey, Kratz, sorry, dude, but be better at blocking the plate. 
Yep. 100%. Me too. If it was me, they'd be like, yeah, who cares? Be better. No, you don't think you're AJ Pruszynski rule status? No, I got run over lots of times. They didn't change the rules. They encouraged it more. They were like, hit them, hit them hard. <laughs> uh, true. All right, good stuff. Um, that's it for uh, Charge the Mound. Shop at tirespaceball.com where you'll find high quality tires, maple bats, pine tar grip sticks, rosin bags, and other accessories. The pros know Tyrus. Do you? And if you need to learn how to do it, watch my video. That's true. The demo. Yeah. It's very well done. We have another one coming soon, I believe, either, I think, later this week. From who? Kratz. Oh, Kratz did one? Yeah. Mine's way, sh- mine's way shorter. I did the stick. There wasn't as oh, much. Jeez. There wasn't as much, like, glam as yours. You had, like, two cameras. I just came like, out for the boys. That's it. It's just, like glitter and streamers dropping from yeah. the sky. Like, and boom, that's it. That's your demo, folks. Well, I mean, if you have a stick where as opposed to – uh, you know, thick and sticky versus regular pine tar versus <laughs> this pine tar, and then you got to use rosin, and then you got to. I mean, I had to do the whole thing. You had it all. Mine yeah. stick dingers. That's it. I had to bring in models. I brought in models. I brought in uh, my son Austin and Thomas Aki, another kid on the team, to to model the bats. I mean, it was a there was a whole lot of work going on. <laughs> check out their PG. Catch up, check out their PG websites, guys. PG websites. <laughs> <laughs> yep, perfect game. Here we go. <laughs> um, also, uh, from yesterday, the Astros continue to roll along, and Jordan Alvarez is getting towards avoid me more status, I would say. Is there any more? I, he doesn't get avoided as he much does. as you Some would think. Some people do. Smart people, smart teams have done it. That, that's my thing. Smart teams have done it. Okay, and let's. Because who's sitting behind him? Tucker. It's pretty good. He's though. good, but still. It's a pick your poison situation. Don't is somebody is did it last not, week, especially in big moments. It's one thing, base is empty, you know, early on in a game. Well, okay, right. I know that's what I'm saying, but late in a game or runners on, I think with the bases loaded, he's hitting like 450, and it's not a small sample size anymore. Might want to be, and I know base is loaded, obviously. You got to somebody did nowhere it last put week, him. though. Somebody walked him in a big situation. Yeah. And it didn't hurt him at the time, but it turned the line. We talked about it. it turned, turned the, the lineup, lineup over, over. again. Mm-hmm. And then they ended up winning. Okay. But for, Tucker got the hit to walk For doing off. that one time, how many times are, do we look at it and go, wow, fucking hung one to your You're going to walk with the bases loaded? No, I just said with the bases loaded, I get it. But tight game, you know, runner on second in the eighth. Maybe I'm at least, yeah, I'm putting up four fingers or at, at least – being ultra careful if it's a guy who has control. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. just walk him. Kratz, how many times did you ever catch? And uh, the, the manager would give you this one. Be smart. Oh. <laughs> and then you, you end up throwing like a nasty slider and he gets a hit. And you come in and the manager's like, why'd you throw him that pitch? And we're like, dude, next time just put four fingers up. You don't want him to get a hit because these dudes are good. They know what we're trying to do to them. So just put the four fingers up. Let him go to first. Whenever, whenever I would get this one, A, be smart, I would always look out the mound. And I remember thinking a couple of the pitches that I had out there, I'm like, mm-mm, four. <laughs> Give him four. Nope. Not going not gonna to do it. Because there's no way. You can't tell a guy, hey, make your slider nastier. Some guys, like our strike throwers, to a guy like Jordan, I'd just be like, no, nah, man, he throws too many strikes. He doesn't have enough to get him out. I think Jordan's up there in the top, top four guys that – you're afraid of facing in the league right now with runners in scoring position. I think he's a really good hitter, but I think there's another elevation of players when you talk about guys with runners in scoring position. My thing was last year when we were watching Judge go on a historic tear and then he calmed down a little bit in those last, what, five weeks or so of the season and guys were even saying, like, I don't want to give up the big homer and all that. I think there was also just finally a mentality change where some teams were like, we are not Bonds, but we're going to treat this guy very close to untouchable. No? Yeah. That changed for me, especially in the second half. Also, no one was hitting for them Also, besides him. There's I, and- a macho side of it where <laughs> you're the pitcher and you're like, screw this dude. I'm, my stuff's good enough to get him out. But that's stupid. Well, it is stupid, but Scratch just said pitchers are stupid. <laughs> I mean, but also, but also like, like think in this situation – 
Jordan has 151 played uh, at bats this year. He has how many played appearances? 178. He has 12 homers. Are you really worried about him hitting a homer? So to me, you attack him how you would attack him that he can't make contact, which is going to be chases out of the zone if it's a situation. Like you just can't – like 12 homers, that's a lot of homers. But there's still 162, 66 other at-bats, plate appearances, that he hasn't hit a home run. Like, so you can't – it's not Barry Bonds. It's not Barry Bonds, but he still does a lot of damage. I think if you're fine with putting him on first base and to mix him with what you're saying, then you just throw – you nibble around the zone and try to get him to extend a little bit and reach for something. That's the only way. I'm not throwing that man anything that he can get his bat extended on late in games with guys on. He's proven already he's one of the best in the league at that in that moment. He's easily at this point a top three clutch hitter yeah. in baseball right now. Oh, yeah. We used to have a saying, one of my old coaches – he just go. He go like this. Yeah. Whenever there was fingers. a guy we couldn't get out, yep. He just hitting doubles and homers off us. You go, put him on. At least we know he's on first. Or Instead of standing him. on second or circling the pillows, mm-hmm. just put him on first. Just say hit him or hit him <laughs> <laughs> or hit him. <laughs> you can only do that so often before that becomes a problem. Then you start getting your dudes drilled. Yeah, exactly. Go just, just on first. Where guys? Yeah, hit him in the knee. Can't steal second. That's what I used to say. Hit the fast guy in the knee so that way he can't steal second. Wow. Did anyone listen to you? No. That's why they stole. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only reason you gave up stolen bases. Well, right? that night, you know, that was it. <laughs> you, know who was, you know who was the best at that? Low Kane. Low Kane would walk down to first with a limp and, like, take his time, and you'd be like, okay, at least he's not stealing. And then first pitch, he's gone. Gone. Every time. Amazing. You'd he's pick fa- over three times. He couldn't stand up fast enough. He's yeah. Like, oh, does the old gramp on oh, my back, my back. First pitch. See ya. Fastest healer in the that. league. Yeah, he's talked about that. Did they didn't Salvi at his uh, retirement ceremony the other day give him a cane? He did. Yeah. <laughs> like you're always bitching about your legs and your knees. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, you're a freaking insane athlete in your what mid thirties. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my back. <laughs> Whatever. It worked. It worked. Nice guy and and baiting people mm-hmm. into stolen bags. I mean, Bregman did that this past weekend when we spoke to yeah, him. Oh, because crap's Oh, him. I can't run. Oh, I don't steal bags anymore. Just kidding. And he's hot. And he's hot. Just saying. All right. Yeah, there was FD a good got him right. Hey, do you trade? Do you trade your Don straight up for Mike Trout? Mm. No. Mm. Who says no? I'm, but do I'm telling the you right now. The angels say no. The Angels say no, but for contract, for contract, and damage, and... Oh, well, contract, I that's think true. Both say no. You think both teams say no? Yeah, because the Astros... They have the equal... They, the Astros Jordan? aren't taking the... the no. con- they don't pay guys like that. They paid Jordan. Not like Trout. You want to cool. see the difference between Jordan yeah. and Trout contracts? Well, it's ridiculous. I mean, obviously, Jordan signed a, a well-before free agency deal, so seven... No, wait, where are we here? Six years... 115 Six million for 115. last year in early June. Trout's like, yeah, I'll quadruple that. <laughs> okay, so here, here's, here's, so for this year, Jordan 305, 12 homers, 46 RBIs, 1000 OPS, 1015. Trout this year, 276, 10, 23, 874 OPS. Your OPS plus 138 for Trout, OPS plus for Alvarez, 175. Okay. And Jordan's a better outfielder than people give him credit for, too. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I mean I'm not saying do it, but in I'm Houston. just saying. He doesn't have a lot of place to run. But yeah, I'm saying yeah. it's a it's a real conversation if you think about it. Which one would you rather have right now? Uh, Jordan. Okay. There you go. Right now? Yeah. I'm, it's, a legitimate, right now. it's a legitimate conversation. Yes, it's a good combo. I agree. Hey, let's bring in our first guest today, Gavin Sheets from the Chicago White Sox, joining us. On FT Live, Gavin, great to see you. How's life out there in Chicago? What's going on, guys? Happy to be on with you all. Good to see you. Hi, hey, when was the last time? in Cleveland, you were there? first of all. God damn it, they got shut out yesterday, bastards. <laughs> it was a tough one yesterday. That was that was not not the way you want to start a series. 
No, fair. And Cleveland pitching is really good, especially the bullpen. Yeah, but last time they faced Gattis, they hit five homers off the guy in like two innings. So I was what counting changed? On sheets freaking getting up there, freaking going deep. What changed? <laughs> yeah, that uh, we were hoping for the same thing yesterday, and uh, yeah, uh, hopefully we get back on the horse today. That wasn't that wasn't our best showing yesterday. Yeah, well, I agree. Kipnis was happy. I wasn't, but that's okay. that's a whole different story. Hey, tough place to play. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Gavin, what was it like before we get into before we get into Lance Lynn whole controversy with you? Because there's a lot of things that were flying around from Lance to ask you. So before we even get into it, what was it like growing up in the country clubs and playing tennis as a kid? You know, since your dad was a big leaguer, what, what was that like? Explain. What does that silver spoon? What does that silver spoon taste like? Oh man right to it uh yeah you know ever since i walked in the clubhouse i've heard that from lance and uh that's kind of where i'd say that's where our relationship took the took the turn for the better um you know when i came in i was quiet and you know he was wearing me out with that and i was like okay okay so i i took it i took it as a good rookie should and then you know finally i looked at him and i go you know what he was a big leaguer and so am i and uh (laughs) from that day on lance and i have been pretty close ever since then so uh, i finally cracked him on that one what what else did Lance say? I want to hit I want to hit on your dad for a little okay. bit here. Not actually, not actually, not actually hit on your dad, but I want to hit a piece <laughs> on. You know where your dad went to college? Yeah, you guys went to uh, Eastern Mennonite, both of you. Somehow you guys made it out of there to the big leagues. Except he didn't. That's this is the whole. This is the he's the first person to go to Eastern Mennonite University. He went to Eastern Mennonite College. Yeah. He's the first person to make the big leagues. I was the first person to get drafted because your pops got drafted at a high school, right? Yeah, and then he went there and played basketball. And has all the basketball records. So are you a better or worse basketball player than him? Oh, way worse. Way worse. He, <laughs> he talks. I, I think he talks more about his basketball career in college and in high school than he does playing baseball. It's impressive. Wait, Wait, where's it's East Mennonite? Where's, career, for sure. where's East Mennonite? Where the heck is that? In the boonies. Eastern. Bur- oh, sorry. Where is where? What town is that in? Yeah. I couldn't even tell you. Yeah, Harrisonburg. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Do you guys still? No, Harrisonburg, Virginia. Oh, geez. Okay. Do you guys like he grew up? He grew up in Stanton, right? Your dad grew up in Stanton, right? Yes. Yeah. It's the Valley League. The Valley League. The Valley yeah, about five. League. Did you play in it? Had. No, I did not. I I played in in the uh, in the Maryland League and then in the Cape. So I stayed away from Stanton. <laughs> Kip, you forgot, dude. He's Silver Spoon. Dude. He doesn't play yeah, in the Valley League. Right to the Cape. Yeah, right to the Cape. Yeah, though, right right to to the the Cape. Cape. <laughs> I wouldn't would have lasted a day in the Valley League. <laughs> so so your dad went to Eastern Mennonite, where Kratz also went. I never heard of it until today. So way to go. But you went to Wake Forest. Yeah. Wake Forest is the number one team in the country in baseball right now. Did you ever think you'd see Wake Forest number one in baseball? I did not. Um, it's really cool to see. I'm really happy for the coaches there because, you know, I, I still have a good relationship with them. And um, But they've put so much money into their facility, and they've got a pitching lab now that is really better than a lot of the big league teams have. Um, so it's I knew it was coming, but I didn't think it would be this fast. Did, did you put in the yellow turf they have? Because that yellow turf is not a good look on TV. It's it's not a good look. Uh, I wasn't a fan of it when I played. I think it's newer now, but I don't love it. I don't love the gold the gold look. Hey, Gavin, um, on this current team, you know, and now that you're getting some years into your big league career, are guys coming up to you, some of the younger guys, um, turning to you for advice and who are you spending time with, you know, especially off the field when you're on the road grabbing dinner in Cleveland? Yeah, um, you know, not as much advice. We, we talk about a lot of things, you know, you know, Jake Berger right now is is tearing it up. Um, I'm really close with him and Vonnie and and Romy Gonzalez. And, um, you know, I help where I can in terms of just like the growing pains, the the, you know, the different scouting reports, the way they change and the way guys start to attack you differently when you start to do some damage. And, um, but it, it's a great group of guys. Um, you know, I'm hoping, I think that we're taking the turn for the better right now and putting together a pretty good month of May and, um, hopefully ride this through June and, and the rest of the year and make a strong push. 
I think that's the right ad too. When you guys, when you guys go out, what's your, how about start with Chicago? What's your favorite restaurants in Chicago that you've been going to? Oh, I love Chicago. The, the, uh, the steakhouse there on the water. I mean, I don't, Chicago. I don't think it's any, yeah. I don't think it gets any better than there. There's see, that's, that's part of the reason I was five pounds overweight every spring training is because I was just <laughs> hibernated during the winter and came up to Arizona coming from Chicago. It's not easy. You guys yeah, got you, the roster. You just said you had the right uh, mentality or something. What do you think it's going to take uh, for you guys to get to that next step, though, to keep pushing through these the dog days that come with July and August? It's going to be a sense of urgency, you know, showing up yeah. every day that we have to win. Um, you know, we can't. We're not in a position right now where we can take any games off. We have to win every game that we go out and play. And, um, you know, we've dug ourselves in a hole, and we know that. And, you know, if we don't have a sense of urgency and we're not going out there to win every night, then we can't make up this ground. Um, but if we can go out and bring the energy every day and, and come out and, and really have a sense that we need to win all these games, um, I, I think we have a shot. Hey, Gavin. So all uh, the oh, go ahead, Chris. I don't Oh, no, I was just going to say, of all the ex-Chicago superstars that played for the White Sox, is there any that are more annoying and you're sick of seeing when they come into the clubhouse than AJ? <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, I, I level of one to three. Like, where is he at? I'm not going to lie. I don't think – I haven't been in the, the show long enough for him to talk to me yet. So, um, hopefully <laughs> – <laughs> 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 Hopefully next time he comes through, he'll 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 come by. Um, but no, no, no that's no, not no. true because I talked to Jimmy Lambert last time for like twenty minutes, and he's been in there less than you. Uh, it's he just was personal just to, then. He was sucking up to you. Then. Um, <laughs> but no, no, I I love AJ. He comes, to, he does a bunch of our Fox games, so um, it's always fun. <laughs> Thanks, Crouch. I love you too, buddy. <laughs> I, I want to know yeah. because Kip kind of hit on it. You said the other day. This division isn't over. You, yeah, you no, said it. No. So what do you got to do? Catch the Twins, catch the Guardians, catch the Tigers. Gosh, never thought I'd say that this year. But, you know, you guys are in fourth place. Like, dude, what the heck? Yeah. Um, no, a April was frustrating. It. Uh, we didn't play our best baseball. We, we weren't healthy. Um, but that's not even an excuse. I mean, we just – I, I really think it's a sense of urgency. You know, we need to go out every day and we need to prove that because I believe we're the most talented team, um, but we have to prove it. You know, it, you can say it, you can put it on paper, but that means nothing. And the only way we can catch these teams is by winning baseball games. And, um, you know, we, we've done a good job the last, you know, 10 games, week or so, and, um, but that's not enough. You know, we got to put together a really a good two-month stretch or month stretch and, um, you know, really kind of bear down on these guys and, and start to, to really narrow this, this deficit. All right. So I, we had Bregman on the other day and he was talking about how the new, the new bags and everything and the new disengagements, all that stuff really is enhanced stolen bases. And I told him he had zero bags. You do realize that you're, you're approaching a career of zero bags <laughs> and you're almost hitting my amount of at bats with zero bags in their career. So I need you to get one soon because, yeah. and how is that going to happen when you do it? Oh, man, I'm going to have to pick a guy that's got like a 1-8 leg lift. Uh, maybe hit him with the walking lead, start on the bag, and just walk right into it. I've been talking to Debo about that. Uh, I need to break that one out. I think, that's, I think that's the best way to get my first bag. No, no, here's what you got to do. You got to wake Debo up because Daryl Boston, the first base coach, is sleeping all the time. Every time I walk in the Chicago clubhouse, <laughs> Daryl Boston's in the recliner <laughs> Every single time. So you first you're gonna have to wake him up, and then you're gonna have to pick a pitcher. And yeah. You're gonna say, okay, we're going. We're gonna. This is the guy we're getting. All right? Don't give away any secrets. But first, wake Daryl Boston up. Yeah, hundred percent. Did, you, <laughs> did you wish? He he finds a new room every place we go. That's where that's where he finds his hideout, and then you got to go find him when you need extra work or something. Because he he picks the room that no one knows about, and that's where he, that's where he camps out. That's right. That's he's he's famous for that. Yeah. <laughs> Did, did you wish Lance Lynn a happy birthday not long ago? And did you get of him course. a present? Of course. So uh, I've gotten him a bunch of – I gave him a bunch of presents. Uh, I left a, a donut in his locker one day. Uh, I signed a baseball <laughs> card for him the next. Um, I sent him a, a happy 50th gift in the morning to wake him up just to, to start his day on the right foot. Um, you know, I just – trying to be nothing but respectful for him. That's perfect. That's perfect. Lance, as long as you send him like a case of beer, he'll be really happy. 
oh yeah, that's that's the way to his heart <laughs> and his stomach. Yeah. <laughs> you I, I, you know that we have the ball. I have the ball, the the first pitch ball that Lance that Lance missed. So Lance wanted to know what was worse, him clanking the ball, or that triple you gave up in Minnesota. I'm gonna go with the triple. Uh, you know that's. Uh, Luckily, he got the air on that one. I didn't get the air on it, um, but easily the triple in Minnesota. <laughs> what? What? What happened? Because I, I, I watch every White Sox game. Like you slipped. You were wearing plastics and you slipped. We'll go with that. Yeah, we'll go with that. Just uh, lost <laughs> the foot. Uh, lost, lost the footing on it. Um, luckily, haven't done that since. That was a that was a tough tough day. Um, but that's suck for Gio because he's throwing the ball so well. But yeah, those are the moments that that you hope that you're never a part of. Uh, and unfortunately that day, <laughs> that day I was out there in the outfield laying down. But how, how have things been going for you overall on defense? I mean, many fans pointing out right now in, in the chat here and making some great defensive plays. Have you felt better than ever this year out there? Yeah. I, I think the more, the more I get comfortable, the more I play out there, the more reps I get um, just more and more comfortable and uh, starting to get better jumps in the ball, better reads, um, but it's just, it just comes from reps, you know, getting a lot of early work, BP reps, um, but it's getting better. Yeah. It's, it's definitely more comfortable. And then we do have a fan, uh, Jackson asked, Hey, last week sheets was ejected by Dan Isonia after two horrible strike calls. Your thoughts. Yeah, it was my first one. Uh, it felt, I'm not going to lie. It felt good. Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, it was a definite. It was a buildup. Um, there was a buildup of, of games in a row, and um, I knew I knew I was getting defensively replaced after that. It was the seventh inning, and yeah, it was just uh, not the best call I've had on me. And it felt it felt good to get out of the way. <laughs> AJ, how many AJ, times have you gotten? And AJ us? both have sons. Of, oh, I don't do too many. Ten, I think. Ten. How how would you handle it the next day? Would you go up to the guy and? Yeah. It was over. You did? You would go up to the ump, though? I'd see him in the tunnel after the game, and we'd have a laugh about it. <laughs> it was very rarely a day where I got ejected that I didn't see the umps the next day or so, talk to him. So what did, what did Gavin do? I don't know. Let's ask him. I, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, I didn't play the next – I didn't I didn't talk to him. Um, usually it's not – I would say usually it's not the, the one umpire that wears it. It's, it's usually a buildup of things. So uh, usually it's just that's the guy that you take it all out on. Um, <laughs> And that's kind of what happened with me. I mean, he, it was, it was a couple games building up. So, um, no, no, no ill will towards him. I think that's a mature thing. I think you say that to him next time too. Yeah. How many times did you get thrown out, Kip? One time. <laughs> one, one special time. So you already tied with me in that. You got one stolen base to get, and you're already tied with me in ejections. <laughs> I think it was like an 11 a.m. game in Detroit versus Verlander. I think I had bases loaded. I had a bad call on it. Yeah, and uh, I think it was Lance Barksdale or something. And the guy, the guy's got Cy Youngs. You don't need to be helping him. And then I also mixed in a couple of choice words. And I think I was back in the kitchen by noon. Yeah, 11 a.m. That's that's a tough one, anyways. I, I was already grumpy, probably. I yeah, didn't. Yeah. I didn't <laughs> Gavin, what me and AJ, we have sons who are 16 years old. What's it like growing up with a big league dad? And how what could we do to not screw up our our son's lives <laughs> and careers if, if they wanna if they wanna play baseball? Like, did your dad do well? Did he like what are some things he did really well and what are some things we should not do as dads? Yeah, he was, you know, I, I always thought that he handled it really well. Um, he coached, he coached me in high school. He coached me in travel ball. Um, you know, the best thing I thought from him compared to, you know, some of the guys I play with whose dads didn't play is he understood how hard the game was. And I think that's something that's very underrated because, you know, a lot of dads who didn't play baseball or played and were good in high school, they don't understand how hard the game is. And so he always had, he always had my back in terms of that. He, he understood the struggles. Um, instead of beating me down, he was, he was trying to build me up, trying to tell me how hard the game was and, um, you know, another thing he did was he, he told me to quit baseball and play golf in, in middle school. So, uh, you know, that was, that was something else that he said, you don't have to play baseball for me. He said, you know, I think that you're probably better at golf at this point in your career. And if you want to play golf and, and go ahead with that, then, then go for it. But, 
Um, no, he was always very supportive, though, other than, other than telling me to, uh, to maybe hang him up. Wait, so how good are you at golf? Like, we, th- this does come up, of course. Like, are you Ian Happ, Jeff McNeil, Aaron Hicks status? Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm at that status. I play a lot in the off season. Um, you know, I can probably get down to a, to a one or scratch in the off season. Um, so I, I do, I do enjoy playing golf, but so he was, he was, he wasn't totally wrong. And I think when I was 12, I was probably a better golfer than baseball player. Um, before I hit puberty, I mean, I was, I was brutally bad at baseball and I think he <laughs> saw it. So, um, I had to appreciate the honesty from him, but uh, I'm glad I stuck with it. Yeah, now you're what six six two fifty. Yeah, so uh, at that time I was I was probably as round as I was tall. So uh, <laughs> things got better. It worked out. Awesome, Gavin. Great to have you on, man. Appreciate it, and good luck the rest of the week, dude. Love good to luck. have you back. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it as always. Cheers, Gavin Sheets from the Chicago White Sox with us on FT Live, and I know some of you looking out for the Clank Ball giveaway. We'll get to that soon. So what we're going to do on here quick little retune that we need to do on the YouTube stream. You don't have to go anywhere. It's still going to be running, so you can hang around, and I'm actually going to be in the chat. So any questions you have, especially for AJ, who's sitting right next to me. I'll um, jump in the chat, too. Yeah, he'll, Oh, there you go. Yeah, He'll jump in the chat. So stand by, BRB, on FT Live.
Let's run it. FT Live, Pat Murphy from the Milwaukee Brewers joining us in just a moment. And we will do that giveaway announcement, the Clank Ball, spending its last few precious seconds in the hands of A.J. Pierzynski. I feel bad for that ball, but it's going off to a better home. Maybe I'll just keep it. No, it's going to a better place eventually. So signed by A.J. and Lance. Yeah, it Lance doesn't have took, to deal Lance with us Lance made the value go down faster. <laughs> <laughs> we had Lance the other day. And who was it? Was it you? You were like, do you know what your ERA is? It's 666. Six, six. Was that you? Yeah, because yeah. it was. And it went down. <laughs> had to. Go down. I was like, cold. Jeez. Anyway, uh, we'll also talk to Zach Buchanan from The Athletic about the surging Arizona Diamondbacks who have won eight of their last ten games. Uh, They were victorious again. And there was just a really interesting story about Madison Bumgarner and the split there and some of the drama that went down behind the scenes. So we'll get to that as well. We'll do our picks. And what do you got here? Well, I mean, Kipnis has his ASU helmet, so I figured I'd double him up and go two for one. I was going to say, you did. Hey. What's the one in your right hand? This one? Yeah. So you I went to know, right? Look, yeah. look. So I went to an ASU game. They played UCLA on a Thursday night, and they wore these helmets. They're like the sun, the fire. So, yeah, you can see it. Did you and then, it? so they gave me one, and then this one is the Pat Tillman one. I love it. That's awesome. That's so the, pretty sick. The, as you can see, the Ranger, the Pat Tillman camo. It's got the names of all the fallen people on the back. It's How many helmets best. you got? I have too many helmets. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of helmets around my house. Oh, Kip's got it too. We got the number. I got. I mean, dude, don't. I mean, I got twelve around the back. <laughs> there goes your AirPod. No way your AirPod stays in. Stayed in. Wow, he sounds. He actually sounds better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> looks better too. Murphy likes some football that. gear. He no will, dude. I can't. I gotta. I gotta. Oh, you got your earpiece. I got. I have an actual earpiece. In. Yeah, no, we I don't, don't want to lose, lose my hearing. hearing. Yeah, it was in this year. You said every day I'd be okay with it, but this this year I need. Yeah. All right. Well, let's bring in our guest right now, Pat Murphy. We appreciate the time, Pat. Great to talk to you. Brewers bench coach joining us right now. I'm mostly Pat, and good to see you. And we've had some great conversations on the field, but I'm mostly going to let all these rascals take over. So, Kratzy, why don't you uh, say hello and and do the proper introductions, please? I mean, it's Pat Murphy. What other introduction do you need? The guy is – who did you steal that shirt from? Like, there's no way – like, is that is that your line? Is that your is that like your you're the hitting coach now? You got a hit H-I-T. shirt. HIT. Jace Peterson had it and gave it to me. I don't turn down free shirts. So why are All you sweating? You- Did you just tie your shoes or put on your socks? <laughs> I was out in the field with my four year old, my eight year old, with Wade Miley and Pedro uh, throwing diving catches. <laughs> <laughs> How's Wade doing? He's awesome. He's he's on the mend. He's 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 throwing, he's throwing to the little kids, and the trainers are having a, having a fit because he's not the supposed to throw. <laughs> Wait, are you in? Are you in Council's office? No, I'm in uh, Shogger's office. Oh, it's okay. actually my office. It's actually my office. I tell Shogger, I let him use it. But Wade should just tell the trainers that's part of the rehab, right? You throw diving catches to the kids. Wade rehabs in a different way than anyone else. Anyone who knows Wade knows you just you just have to to know him, to understand him. He's got enough dirt in his spikes. I, I think he earned it. So, hey, Pat, give us the uh, the broad view of what this team looks like right now. How much fun are you having, and, and what are your Ooh. thoughts? Well, I mean, we've faced some adversity, obviously. you got three of your starters down now, um, three of your starting pitchers, one big woo. I mean, you know, he sets the tone. He just comes at you. He has a way about him that – Having him out of there changes things. You know, being the small market team we are, we don't have the depth. Um, so it's been rough. It's been rough. Um, and then to lose Wade Miley. But, you know, when you lose Wade, he's only been healthy for the full season one time in the last four or five years. But he brings so much to your clubhouse. So he's still doing it. You know, he's still here every day talking to young players, helping young guys. So he's uh, – Kratzy, you remember in 18 – the, the impact he had. Um, and uh, so, so losing him's big, 
but at least we keep his clubhouse present. Now Eric Lauer's down. He hadn't been throwing the ball the way he wanted. So we're kind of decimated on the mound. We've got, uh, you know, Mitchell went down early. Um, he was playing really good. And the difference maker in our lineup with his speed. And then uh, Urias hasn't played all year. So we've been just trying to piece it together. And um, there's been moments that look like, yeah, we could be okay. And then there's been moments that, uh, yeah, you're like, oof, we need some help. Who's taking over the uh, – who hits the best infield pop-ups now that Moustakas isn't there anymore? <laughs> Moose, the silo ball. Moose was the <laughs> best. So the, you guys don't know this, but um, Kratzy knows it. I would keep two charts <laughs> taped up on the wall that never came down in the dugout. One was Travis Shaw's broken bats, and the next was Moose's silo balls. And they'd both be so pissed, and they would come back hit a silo ball or break a bat, and I'd be over there with my marker just tallying up. And uh, hopefully I was trying to bring some some levity to the situation, but didn't, the timing wasn't always <laughs> right. But uh, would, nah, Moose, Moose can hit him like nobody else. You would definitely – and you would wait too. Like there's plenty of time. The pop-up would go up, and if you were pissed, you would just go right over and just mark it and not make a big deal out of it. But if you if – that grin, that's the grin right there. If you had that grin <laughs> on, you would wait and you would watch them walk down the dugout. And then as they'd walk by, you put their bat or broken bat or helmet in the rack. You would be like <clears> – <throat> and then you would mark it <laughs> as they would come by. So that's, that's, just, a little, that's just a little piece of yeah. Pat Murphy. That's what he brings, including bagels, in his oh. sliders – to every day game. Tell us where that started. I'm not sure, Kratzy. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it ever happened. I don't remember it as well as you do, but um, I like to share a snack before a game once in a while and share a bagel. It's kind of like a connection thing and uh, ask the guys to stay connected. So oftentimes they do. I got Mitchell on it. Uh, Brasso took a piece, then find out where it came from and then ask for another. <laughs> I think you one of your best qualities, I think, as a, a manager, as a coach, I think is you like to, the way you dig into these players, you're testing their mental toughness each day. I think you want to see what they got and if they have it each day. I think you expose people who are not maybe the toughest, I think, and you try to get the most out of them. I could go on numerous stories just from college alone, but uh, it appears you have continued to do so to where you like to check in and how your team, how your players uh yeah. If they're ready for the nine innings that day. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, Kip, you say that, because in a real serious note, like, I really do want to impact guys or keep them on track. You know, like, I'm not here to, to dominate them or to necessarily change them. I just want to impact them by saying, you know, keep your your head down and your wheels on the road and, you know, realize this is a team. Realize there's a next pitch. You can't be – you can't be down about the last pitch or the last result. There's a next pitch that you have to be your best self for. Anyway, some of what I do is misunderstood from the outside, but I think on the inside you can see that my intent is really good. I'm not just a hard ass trying to beat you over the head. You know, it's like my intent is is, is good, and uh, I don't know if it's effective or not. But you know, I got a locker today, so. Well, hopefully I'll have one tomorrow. Must be doing must be doing something right. I think one of one of my favorite stories is from I don't even know if you remember this because there's just the countless stories that come from from Packard and Tempe at this time. I think some junior pitcher, sophomore junior pitcher came in, walked two in a row, you took him out. We had a meeting after the game or something. We still won the game, and you just started laying into him. And then you're like, You need to pitch better. And then you looked at this red or this freshman right there. He's like, because I don't want to put this guy in. Do not make me put this guy in next to you. And you're see, just testing everyone. Those are even, made up. Those are made no, up. No, they're not. No, they're not. No. See, that's, you know, you know who did this the other day? Rowdy Telez. Rowdy Telez made up a story about when he first met me, and everyone believes it, and it's a total lie. Um, and, you know, because, you know, Rowdy told it with such, you know, enthusiasm, people really believe it. And now you're doing it right now. I remember that day. I remember that day. I said, look, 
don't worry. You won the game. We got through it. You will never walk three batters in a game while you're here because I will always take you out after two. <laughs> hey, Murph, just so you don't feel bad, Rowdy came on this show and he made up a story about me that I told him to F off when he was a kid in San Francisco. So when you see Rowdy and he puts that cheese head on, hit him over the head with it for me, okay? Because he did it I to you and me. No, it's real. I mean, he told this story that he, he we traded for him and he came to the Mets and or he came while we were playing the Mets and I get to the field first and he's laying on the couch, which he does well. And um, so he's a new player. And he said, I threw my shoes at him and said, hey, clean these clubby. Now, everybody believes that he looks like a clubby and, and, and uh, doesn't look like a ball player. But I didn't do that. I've never had the clubby clean my shoes yet. But um, everybody believes it, you know. What would you what would you tell your younger self as a coach back when you are and, and I'll before you answer that, before you answer that, I will back up what you just said about impacting guys, because when I quit playing, you texted me and you were like, Well, whatever you do, make sure you find something that you impact people. So this is something that Pat lives by. But we're not gonna we're not gonna we're not gonna build you up too much. Yeah, that's not what would you tell yourself now that you didn't know as a young coach? Because AJ is a young coach, and he wants to know. <laughs> yeah. Well, honestly, I mean, this profession is sacred. And the problem is there's no qualifications for it. Maybe if you played a little bit, and that's been proven that that doesn't always help. And, you know, the profession needs people without an ego that wants to be an offensive lineman, that wants to open holes, that wants to let the other guys run through it and dance in the end zone and do what they have to do. But – the profession is to open holes and, you know, it's about love and discipline and the ones toughest to love lead the, need the love the most. And um, if I understood any, I mean, I was, I was just an idiot when I was young and just, it was all about winning and, and I had a football mentality and it was about winning and nothing was going to stand in the way. And because I racked up a bunch of wins and got a bunch of big jobs, people thought I was good, but I wasn't because I didn't understand, you know, the role of the coach still. It wasn't just to win. It was to pre prepare these guys great to be able to stay connected, be ready for the next pitch, stay kind of in their process and just play the best and learn how to compete. And, you know, Sometimes guys don't know how to compete, no matter what background they came from. A tough kid from the streets or a, a soft kid from the suburbs in you know, uh, Illinois. They don't always know. <laughs> I know you heard that, Kim. I know you heard that, Kim. They don't always know how to compete, but some of them do. In Kip's case, of course, he knew how to compete. And he just needed someone to believe in him and love him. And oftentimes... You know, when you look back in your coaching, if you're satisfied with it, you're not doing the job. There's so much we could have done different. There's so much we could have helped with um, that, that we just our ego gets in the way. So this has been a great, great life for me. I feel like I'm just getting to the point where I'm starting to be consistently, um, you know, consistently prepared and potentially impactful Um on a consistent basis and I'm 64 years old and people think I'm too old, but it's like, it's silly because I'm better than I've ever been and more aware than I've ever been. So as you take on coaching, when the ego's involved, it, you know, when, when the loss creates that black hole inside of you and you take it personally, that's not right. You know, you should be preparing to rally these young men to get to the next stop, not just in their career, but the next game. To be clear, you know, to be convicted, playing that next game, and not to be bogged down by the result or the standings or any of that other BS. Right. Well, I think I'm I'm living proof of uh, your impact. I don't think I'd be here, obviously, being able to interview. I think that's pretty cool that uh, I can honestly thank you for getting all the way <laughs> to this point. Um, and I can prove that you're getting a little softer. I think maybe the best version I've seen of you was probably two years back. Uh, in the stands at ASU, getting to watch Kai play for Arizona <laughs> State. I think that was one of the coolest moments I've seen. Oh, uh, yeah. I think the first time I've seen you nervous around a baseball field. Um, so what was that like, getting to just be a father and not a coach yeah. and getting to watch Kai play? I know he's with the Padres now, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the minor leagues, but that had to be pretty sweet to see him go back there. Yeah, you know, I didn't want him to go there, um, um, but that's what he that's what he chose, and he made the most of it and uh, did well. But being in the stands, watching him, and again, it made me a better coach. When he was born, it made me a better coach. I realized, oh, everybody loves their kid the way I love my son. Oh, my God. You know, I better be a little more respectful. Or then watching him play, I can think of all – I thought of all the dads out there watching their kids play and um, not having the experience I have in the game. So not to be able to watch it in a critical way. Um, but what a, what a great thing. And having you there, Kip, and uh, the way – to see your success no, – no kidding. To see your success, that kid that came in – um, hungry as you were and just you got a book scholarship and you just made the most of it and you just instantly impacted our team and um, you wanted to win and I knew you were going to be a successful professional and uh, that's to say the least I'm not sure I picked up those books though but we, we made it there on the back end <laughs> <laughs> the education system has to change Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Murph, you I, – I, I always bring this up when people talk about, like, how do the Brewers keep making it? How do they keep making it? And I point to the coaches. I point to you. I talk, You know, I point to a big person that I always point to because these guys that are out there and are doing what they're doing, they're told what they're supposed to do. They're told, hey, you know, they're built up and they're just getting the most value is a guy like Counts. Counts is kind of a lame duck right now. No contract. Yeah. Like counts can work anywhere he wants, man. The counts, counts, is, counts can call the shots right now. He's he's um, he can if he wants to stay here in Milwaukee. I'm sure he can. I'm, I, I don't know the particulars, but how can you not be pleased with the way this guy has developed into a great manager? And he's and, and he's aware he has to get better. He's not a guy that this is the way I do it. You know, um, he's. He's terrific, man. He's a great decision maker, you know, you know, bad personality, but great, great decision maker. Um, not funny, but great decision maker. Um, and he, and he went, he knows how to win. He knows how to handle a bullpen. He knows how to handle a pitching staff and he wins games. And he's, and the guys love him because you guys all know you want to be able to walk in that guy's office and get the honest truth. And they all get it. Every single time. And he ain't candy coated. I promise you. You know, I'm kind of a candy coater. I want you to come in and feel good. And then I want to kind of break it to you kind of softly. He counts as like, boom. You know, um, he's really, really talented, man. I Here, I coached him for four years. I was brutal to him, by the way. But um, here, I'm in my eighth year working for him, and I've learned more from him, more from him than he ever could have taken from his experience with me. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful. I really am. So if him and his great calves, because you didn't mention how great a calves he has, don't come back and manage next year, are you willing to take over the job, and should you be the first one to take it? No, I mean, I, I, don't, I haven't even thought of that, Kratzy. I can't see him not coming back and managing here. But, um, but Brady's playing. Brady's, you know, he's got to go watch his Big Ten games. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Jack will be at – Jack, his younger one, is going right. to Michigan unless he signs. Um, and uh, so I just don't think that's going to be a, a question. I think he's just going to sit back and um, think about it. And, uh, yeah, I don't even consider that. It doesn't seem right to be in Milwaukee without counts. Murph, I didn't play for you. I don't really know you other than you've talked a lot of shit to me over the years when I came in <laughs> or when I was playing against it you. Worked so both that's ways. Fine. It worked both ways. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I've heard a lot of stories from a lot of guys that played for you. And they told me some you had some crazy rules. So tell me the craziest rule you had as a college coach. Pedroia used to say if you hit a ground ball you had to, or made an out, you had to run back to the home plate and give a high five to the, to the next hitter. So what were the crazy rules you had in college? Well, that particular one, I don't know that. I had one rule, don't misrepresent the program. And I'll be the judge if you misrepresented it. Um, <laughs> the, the, the thing about dapping the guy up from behind you, it was like we wanted to stay connected. So every time you made it out before the next guy went to the plate, you dapped him up. Like, hey, you take over. You know, and um, ah, that's a little college thing. And it, 
it was kind of cool. Other teams started doing it. But um, if you struck out, you walked past the guy, you looked him in the eye, boom. Even though you're ticked off, it ain't about you. You know, it's about it's about passing the baton. You know? Um, so why don't you, you do know, that in the big leagues? Why don't you do that in the big leagues? You know, have, have a, Christian Yelich go up to Rowdy Telez and be like, yeah, dude, let's go. It's your turn. Well, because the way you said it isn't isn't the intent, but <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of like a real thing of connection, and you know you're making it out like a cheerleading thing. But anyway, um, <laughs> well, see, that's how it plays to us not on the inside of these programs. We, yeah, I didn't play for you. That's why. That's why telling you my rules um, won't make any sense to you. It was for the room, the guys in the room, you know. But. Okay. Um, there was no, there wasn't a lot of rules. You couldn't talk to the opponents. That was another thing. Like, you, you had counts got in trouble. Sean Casey came out on whatever channel he's on and said, you know, counts was the nicest guy in the world, but he'd never talked to me on base. I couldn't understand it. And finally, I asked him, you know, why? And he said, well, my college coach had a rule. You don't talk to opposing players. And just tell him one thing. Hey, man, I'd love to talk to you, but my coach is a real jerk. And uh, he had talk <laughs> 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 Casey brought it out and said, yeah, well, Pat Murphy, you're the reason, whatever. But um, You're the reason yeah, why everyone know. hated me too, Pat, because you taught me that when I played for you, so I didn't talk to the other <laughs> team either. So thanks for that. I, under, I understand his pain. No, but uh, no, we had uh, – I just wanted them to focus on, on the right stuff. You know what I mean? It wasn't about how you wore your hair or how you wore your hat or whatever. Uh, Merrill Kelly came to our program and uh, Kip, I don't know, you remember this? No, you were gone. Merrill Kelly came to the program and in recruiting, he said, hey, Murph, I'm not going to wear my pants up, man. I don't, I don't wear those knickers. I don't do that. I need to wear my pants down. And I said, well, fine. Wear them any way you want. And the guys looked at me like, Murph, there's no way you're going to let him wear them any way you want. I'm like, no, he'll be fine. So he came out in fall practice for like three days with his pants down, digging it. And, uh, and then day four, he came out with his knickers. I'm like, Meryl, what happened, man? I was starting to really like those. And he's like, he just stared at me like, you knew. You know, you knew I'd, you knew I'd have them up. But you get to the point where the players run the program, you just want to make sure the players are the right type of guys. You know, and they're who's, thinking right. Who's your favorite player you ever had? And who's the best player you ever had? Yeah. Can't answer either of those questions because favorite and – in different ways, you know. Um, yes, you can. No, I can't. I mean, Pedroia was awesome. Pedroia was awesome. Good. Good. You didn't say Cody Decker, which he said you would say, so thank you. Did he say that? He said that <laughs> he in the interview that, yeah. we did with him yesterday. <laughs> ask Murph who his favorite player was and then ask him why it was Cody Decker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love Cody. Great, great guy. Um <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it. It looks and sounds like it. You just can't I stop do. talking about it. And you just can't give enough praise. <laughs> no, no, I do. But, I, I'm, you know, again, he was making a joke about that, and I'm, I'm making a joke about it too. No, I enjoyed – Cody was in AAA and, and uh, had two real good seasons and and add, added a lot to our clubhouse. And, um, yeah, but, like, when I asked – you know, when somebody asked the old coach, you know, like, who's your favorite player ever? Who's the best player you ever coached? Well – that's kind of for a coach. That's kind of, I mean, I've got many guys. I got Kip's jersey up in my house. I got uh, the Willie Bloomquist and the Craig Councils and the Dustin Pedroia's, Andre, Brett Wallace. I mean, I had some, some, uh, some great players that I coached in college and uh, in the big leagues. I look at, you know, the guys you got hosting this show, Kipnis, Brock Holt. I was only with them like 60 days and, I call him Bernie. Bernie Holt was one of my favorites. He would still be a brewer if he didn't step on a ball and twist his ankle. Um, Lorenzo Cain, you know, one of the greats. Um, you want to talk about teammate. You want to talk about coming to play, unsung hero. And then uh, you got Kratz right there. What a joy to see a guy. I don't know. How old were you then, Kratz? 45, 40, 46? <laughs> but, but this guy came off the scrap heap. He hadn't, he hadn't caught a ball in months. And all of a sudden, he's catching every day. And all of a sudden, he wins the job. And he's leading us to the, to the one game from the World Series. And the guys want to throw to him. He's not framing jack shit. He's just, he's just you know, catching the ball. And he's, he's, engaged, he's engaged with the pitcher. And he's 
he's making that pitcher execute and that team is is impacted because of the way they executed and um i think of guys like that man there, there's a lot of favorite moments so i don't have any one favorite player um and uh best player nah. what, what about the deaf guy was he your favorite player the deaf guy the de- the deaf guy is a, a tremendous human being. The fact that he fell for that for so long, the, the guy, <laughs> Francoeur, Francoeur did an interview. Check it out, guys. Francoeur did an interview with a deaf radio station. Let that one set in for a second. <laughs> <laughs> and as he was doing the interview, he was talking really slow. Hi, I'm Jeff Francoeur from the El Paso Chihuahua. <laughs> I mean, he's a he's a beautiful who, man. Who was the one that who was the one that they pranked about that? Francoeur. Oh, they, they they pranked Francoeur. Yeah, who was the guy that pretended this, to be deaf? Yeah, who was the setup? It was a pitcher. George George Reyes. George Reyes. George Reyes. It has to be a pitcher. It has to be a pitcher. And I did it. I did it maybe six years in a row. And I never intended it to be videotaped. That was Decker's idea. But I, I never, I never uh, intended that. What I intended is that it's, you pull this off for that period of time, it's really kind of brings the team together. And I don't mean to offend any of the deaf uh, people out there or anything like that. It was just meant to be in, in, in all good natured. And some of the stories we have is fantastic. But then Frank Coeur, took it to another level. I mean, he had dinner with him and his wife. He had dinner with George and his wife and talked to him like, hey, you guys don't sign language. How do you talk? Oh, we just text. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen, by the way, if you haven't seen the video, it's online. Yes. Just type in Jeff Francoeur, Chihuahuas, and it comes up right away. It's, of course. It's a great three or four minutes. It got of a lot of play. Hey, it's, hey. it's incredible. It was incredible that he that he just never realized it. And the way it came up, first day of spring training, he got to spring training late. He was with another team. Padres sign him. They go, hey, Murph, you got a new guy today. We had about five days left before the season. You got Frank Cora. I'm like, oh, really? I never met him. So he comes up to me first day, and he goes, hey, Murph, how are you? Hey, Jeff, look, we're going to get you back to the big leagues. You're going you're gonna to bat fourth or fifth every day. Have a great time. Don't tell me when you need a day, but I want you to grab some ABs. So when the time comes, May 1st, you're, you're ready to roll. And uh, he goes, oh, thanks, Murph, whatever. I said, just be, I'll be there every day for you. Just, I'm going to be open. You'll be open with me with what's going on. And, um, and I, oh, by the way, Jeff, we got a deaf kid. You'll, you'll figure it out. We got a deaf <laughs> kid. So just be, be aware of it. He goes, really? I go, yeah. I goes, that's really cool. I said, yeah, just be aware of it. And walked away. And then from that point forward, we had to pick out the guy, figure out who it was going to be. <laughs> And I knew I had him right then. Cause... <laughs> that delivery was good right there. That's perfect. The way yeah. if, you know if it Frenchy, was delivered like that, then forget it. If you know Frenchy too, he's the, he's the nicest guy. So he doesn't he really doesn't want to offend anybody. Yeah, so as soon does. as Murph said it, he was probably like, "Man, I'm going to start learning sign language." Yeah. You know? I mean, you just have to know Frenchy. You guys are. You guys are he's great. A, he's a great. Treat. Well, Pat, it was so great to catch up with you. Appreciate having you on. Um, good luck the rest of the week here, and uh, we'll talk again soon, all right? Thanks, you guys. I love seeing you guys. Thanks, Thanks Murph. Same Enjoy here. Murph. Thank you so much, Pat Murphy of the Milwaukee Brewers, longtime coach. Obviously, could have gone another 40 minutes. Whew. That's good stuff. Dude, he coached a lot of people. He did. He did. And the thing, I mean, we didn't have time, but, I mean, he will chat it up with, you know, opposing players and all of that, like guys just gravitate around him and will go up to him before the game. So clearly now he'll break his own rule of not talking to the opposition, right? Well, because every guy on every team has some connection to yes, him now. Yes, yes, yeah. fair. Very true. And has a story that everyone else wants to hear. So I didn't meet him until Frank Corr introduced me to him. Which was when? Six, 2016. Frank was like, hey, you got to meet this guy. Come on here. And he's like, this is Pat Murphy. And then we started chatting and, you know, started telling the story about, the, you know, and the whole, I mean, it was just, it was great. Listen to him tell stories about everybody. And then he would talk trash to me, talk trash to everybody the whole game. He is wildly entertaining. 
and, and there were questions from fans. Sorry, everyone, I didn't I didn't get to them, but Brewers fans were were definitely enjoying that. So hey, let's bring in our next guest right now, Zach Buchanan, who writes for the Athletic, covering the Arizona Diamondbacks. Joining us right now, Zach, great to have you on. And for you, I mean, now we're getting towards the end of May. Cheers to you covering a team that's. I would say performing better than your expectations. I'm just going to throw that out there as a wild guess. Uh, a little bit better. I mean, I expected them to be competitive. I don't know if I expected them to be, you know, running as well as they have been. Um, so a, a lot of things have seemed to break right um, in their direction. But uh, yeah, it, it, they've been a fun team to watch for sure. Well, Zach, before we go into this, we dig into this interview, why the heck do you have uh, Nolan Ryan beating the crap out of Robin Ventura <laughs> over your shoulder? Uh, so I grew up in Dallas, and my uh, my dad does a charity event every year where they have like a silent auction. They have a speed painter come out and paint things that people bid on. And uh, this is one of the ones that they did, I think, when they, they honored Eric Nadell, who's the radio voice of the Rangers, and my dad got it for me for, uh, I think, Christmas or something one year or so. But uh, I grew up a big Rangers fan going to the ballpark in Arlington. Do you realize that Nolan Ryan came out of there more bloody than Ventura, though? Like, are you aware that, like, that's just a portion of the fight that I think Ryan actually got beat up also? Uh, sh- sure. I also know that Nolan Ryan was, like, 46 or something. So, you know, <laughs> to hold his own is uh, pretty impressive uh, to get a- to walk away from that, I guess. Um, but, yeah, so. No, my buddy had the – remember the Nolan Ryan bloody lip game where he bloodied his lip and it was all – my a buddy of mine – had the jersey. He, his parents were big Ranger fans. They bought the bloody jersey, and he had it in his house when I was growing up. That's awesome. So, the, the Nolan Ryan bloody lip game, mm-hmm. where he, I don't know how he got the bloody lip. I think it was Bo Jackson. I'm with Bo Jackson, maybe. Yeah, it was. I actually just watched that documentary on Netflix about him. It was like I think it was almost kind of a routine ground ball that just kind of clipped him. Yeah. So, so Zach, we'll go to the ball club second. I want to start with your fresh article on Madison Bumgarner's divorce with the ball club. And it's called Behind the Scenes of Madison Bumgarner's Struggles with the Diamondbacks. So he was recently let go by the club. I mean, they had high expectations, signed him to a big deal several years ago. And numbers-wise, clearly it didn't work out. You saw bits and pieces of issues and they would be talked about, but you really took us behind the scenes. So can you run through a little bit chronologically what went down, including, I mean, I didn't know, like reporting to camp, according to the team out of shape and then uh, bickering with Dan Harron. So you can tell it better than I can. Yeah. So so this article is, um, was the result of maybe a month of reporting, but also just kind of the stuff I'd been hearing for the last several years um, at different points in time. And that, that, you know, it, it did kind of start with, um, summer camp, which was admittedly a weird situation for everybody. You know, everybody's at home. They're trying to stay in shape. They don't know when things are going to start up again. But it was notable that pretty much every other pitcher came back into summer camp for the Diamondbacks um, ready to go, and Madison was not ready to go. And it was noticeable. Um, His velocity wasn't there. He looked a little heavier than he had been in spring training. Um, And we saw how that season went. I mean, his his fastball didn't average 89 miles per hour that year, which is I think three or four ticks below his career average. Uh, it was God awful. He dealt with, um, dealt with an injury that year. I think he, he, you know, we were all doing zoom media availability at the time, but I remember he ducked out on his uh, post game media after throwing opening day, which was not a great sign. So um, it you know, kind of unique circumstances, certainly, but it, you know, it, it wasn't great that they couldn't get a hold of him during the shutdown, that um, that he didn't come back ready to go. Um, and, you know, that season went poorly. The next season went poorly. Uh, Matt Hurgis, who was the pitching coach who had been with Bumgarner in San Francisco the previous few years, got reassigned after 2021 when they lost 110 games. And then in comes Brent Strom, who is, you know, Mr. Uh, Premier Pitching Coach. He you know, he's the guy that got an extra gear out of Garrett Cole and Justin Verlander and all these guys in Houston. Um, Madison had very nice things to say about him their first spring together. But by the middle of, of Strom's first season with the club last year, that, that relationship had kind of broke down. Like Brent is a very hands-on pitching coach. He 
He likes to make a ton of suggestions. He feels very strongly about things. Um, he comes from a very data-driven approach. And he, along with a lot of other people with the Dimebacks, felt that Madison simply needed to change the way he did things if he was going to remain effective. His command had been lagging. His arm was late in his delivery. Um, he didn't have as much zip behind the ball. And so they wanted to make some mechanical changes to try and uh, get his his timing a little better. They wanted to make a lot of pitch mix changes. So, you know, Madison's pitch was always the cutter. Uh, and they wanted him to really sunset that pitch to a certain extent, throw more curveballs, more changeups, and really just remake who he was as a pitcher. And I, I think Madison was just constitutionally um, uncomfortable with the idea of doing that and, and having to make these changes and really change the, the guy he always had been, the guy who had been so successful for so long in San Francisco. And he would try things, but he wouldn't really stick with them long enough to, to see if they would really work or not. Um, and at certain points, and including toward the end, the, the Dimex should say, look, you feel so strongly about doing it this way, do it this way. That's fine. And, you know, we all see how that worked out. Did Dimex feel like they got fleeced on signing him? Because, you know, you do, your, you do your research into a guy. Do they feel like they got the guy that they thought they were going to get? Obviously not numbers wise, but the person. Uh, I, to a certain extent, I don't think they did. I, I'm not sure that they would, you know, blow up Madison personally on a personal level. Um, but I, I think they, you know, they, they had just had Zach Grinky, who was the epitome of the guy who reinvents himself. And for all of Grinky's oddities, um, he, his teammates really liked him and, and Madison's teammates liked him too, but Grinky was forward thinking. He, he would always be looking for that edge he would uh, bring the young players along and set good examples. Um, and with Madison, I would hear things, you know, sometimes about him, you know, being late to one of his bullpen sessions or being the first guy out of the clubhouse after a game, that kind of thing. Just things that, you know, he'd done, I'm sure, for years in San Francisco. And because he was Madison F and Bumgarner, you know, no one was going to call him to the carpet. Um, but when things weren't going well, you know, the Diamondbacks would be like, man, I hope our young pitchers don't get the message that this kind of stuff is, is okay. Um, and you know, that's small potato stuff for the most part, but they, they did not get the guy that they thought was going to kind of help bring these younger pitchers along and really kind of show them how to get, how to get the job done in the big leagues. They hoped they would have that kind of veteran influence. And he, he wasn't really that guy. Did it strike you more as like a, a stubbornness to change or an unwillingness to maybe accept that his stuff wasn't the same that it was in San Francisco? Like, yeah, I, I think it's probably closer to the, to the latter. Um, I, I don't think that Madison was just stubborn to change just because he's stubborn. I know he has that kind of persona, but I think it is very tied up with this had always worked. It had worked for years and years and years. It worked for three World Series. Um, and and it, I'm sure that's hard. You guys would know better than I would that to, to confront that point in your career where uh, your results in your body are, are telling it, look, the what has always worked is just not working anymore. And so I think it, that was the thing for him. He just had trouble ex recognizing that he was at that point, that he needed to make major changes. Um, and I think if, if, uh, if he had kind of been able to wrap his mind around that, you know, maybe he, he sticks with some of these alterations a little longer and he does kind of find that second gear. And, you know, it's not over for him. He's only 33. Maybe he gets to that point in the future and makes a, has kind of a career renaissance, which would be great to see. But with the Diamondbacks, it just wasn't the case. Do you think the Diamondbacks are legit? I mean, you look at the run differential here. You look at what they're trying to chase. Do they have enough to chase the Dodgers down? And if not, do they have enough to get a wild card spot, get one of the three wild card spots? I think they definitely have enough to get one of the three wild card spots. You know, it's an interesting situation with the Dodgers, right? Um, most years with the Dodgers, I would have been like, no, I don't think they have a chance to run them down. But th this is a kind of a different vibe of a Dodgers team. Um, they don't really have an everyday shortstop. They're dealing with a million pitching injuries. They, they kind of sat out the winter, right? I don't think they're as big of a juggernaut as they used to be. Uh, clearly they still have a ton of good players. They've got how many, I don't know, former MVPs, James Altman's having a great year. They've got one of the best farm systems in baseball with a lot of guys who are, are coming up and ready to contribute. Um, I, I would still probably bet on the Dodgers to win the division, but uh, it's close enough now that I don't think you could count the Diamondbacks out as for whether the Diamondbacks are for real. 
I think for the most part, yeah, uh, they have some obvious weak spots. Like the bullpen is better than it was a year ago when it was maybe the worst bullpen in baseball, but it's still kind of a soft bullpen. Some of those roles and, and relievers haven't really settled in. And then the, the back three spots of the rotation are Tommy Henry, who just barely passed uh, his rookie eligibility requirements last season, and then Brandon Fott and Ryan Nelson, who are both rookies. And that's just a lot of inexperience to have for 60% of your rotation. And all three of those guys have had outings where they have pitched well. All three of them have had outings where they've just gotten their teeth kicked in. Um, I, I would be surprised if we're getting, if these guys are still in the mix in, in late July, if they don't go out and, and acquire a starter. And they also have Zach Davies, who's working his way back from an injury. He should be maybe back in a week or so. Um, and so they need to figure that out. They need probably need to add a reliever. The offense is going pretty great right now. Corbin Carroll is having an amazing season. Lourdes Gurriel Jr. has found a whole nother level. It might be the best player that, uh, at least for this season, tr- that was in that Dalton Varsho trade. Um, so I think they're pretty legit. I think they're a good team. Interesting, though, Zach. You started with the Dodgers. You didn't start with the Diamondbacks. You said, well, this is why the Dodgers aren't the Dodgers. So that tells me, deep down, the Dodgers are better than you're giving them credit for. Because anytime you ask, like, if I'm asking Scott a question about, like, going clubbing, if he's like, well, you know, I'd rather do Where this and that. Here? No, but I'm serious. Like, <laughs> he should have started with, when Kratz asked him, are the Diamondbacks legit? He should have said yes because of this. But instead he's like, well, the Dodgers aren't as good. So maybe yeah, that's we have well, I was, I was answering the question of will they catch the Dodgers? Because that okay. was also asked. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I'm of, kind of of the mind that until the Dodgers don't win the division, it's the Dodgers division. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, see? They have very much earned that right, the Dodgers. They 100%. win the division every year except for a couple seasons ago with San Francisco. But I thought he was going to start with – well, the Diamondbacks have Corbin Carroll. They have Lourdes Scoriel. Jack Gallon's been good. Merrill Kelly's you been to good. Apologize Andrew Che, you the know, no, for five whoever that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but he, sh- a bit, but you should give credit to the Dodgers. That's yeah, the way to you do start it. Start with your own. If you believe it, you start with your own team. You don't. You don't. He's start. a reporter. He doesn't work for the team. He doesn't give a shit. Yeah, but he covers the Diamondbacks. Okay, um, I mean, he wants him to do well because, as we've talked about, nope. reporters want their no, team to do well. Absolute hogwash, <laughs> always. So let me ask you this. Payroll wise, where are we at? I've been looking at previous payrolls. It seems like at least for the last four or five years, um, they're still hovering in a similar range. But I think, I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong. They've shown the ability to be closer to the upper half of the league in the past, but it's been a minute. Are they a little bit gun shy because of a signing like Bumgarner not working out for them? when they're trying to push the pedal to the metal, this to me would seem like somewhat of an open lane to be like, Hey, let's get after it a little bit more. So wanted to get your take. Like, is the team not making as much money because generally payroll should keep going up for a franchise like this. Correct. Yes. I, I think that the team would tell you, and I, you know, they never open their books. We don't know if it's true that the pandemic hit them kind of hard. Um, you know, that Phoenix is a weird town. Uh, there aren't a lot of diehard fans here. It, getting people to come to the ballpark is really dependent on um, how the team is doing. And also it kind of an X factor, you know, the, the roof is broken. Uh, and so they can't have it open in the middle of the summer for f- fireworks on Fridays, which affects attendance a little bit. It's taken a while to get it fixed. Um, but I, I do think that there is some room to add at the deadline. Um, I don't think they're like at the, their limit and they did up their payroll this season compared to previous seasons. Um, I don't think they make a move like getting uh, cutting Bumgarner uh, if they were kind of at their limit of what they could add. I, because, you know, the money for this year, Bumgarner is already spent, but the money for next year is not. And if they were feeling like, you know, OK, this is our payroll limit, we're not going to spend more money. Maybe there is an argument, a small one for carrying him on next season and just seeing if you can get anything out of that investment. Um, but you know, they've, they've essentially written that money off for next year. Um, I, I, I would, would be surprised if, if, if this team comp- contends, I would be surprised if they don't up payroll next year and make some more additions, because if you look at where they are, their farm system is starting to pay off with all these young major, major leaguers. The, the core is young, it's ready to win, and they're going to need to make some additions to keep pace with juggernauts like the Dodgers and the Padres, who are going to outspend them pretty much every year, no matter what. Um, so I, 
I don't know if I see them kind of getting into the like the top 10 payroll teams in the league. I, I don't I'm not sure that's ever happened outside of when they first put the team together and spent all this money to get Randy Johnson and and Matt Williams and and Mark Grayson, all those guys. Um, a bunch of moves that kind of put the team into the financial red and forced Jerry Colangelo out of the owner's seat. Um, but I, I do think that they have a history under Mike Hazen with uh, Ken Kendrick running the team of when they are ready to win, they have put a little more money behind payroll and, and spent a little more to make it happen. I think you kind of hinted out what I was going with. I think if they kind of buying their time a little bit, they got the young core, developed the young core and kind of knowing that this would might be the Dodgers and Padres division for a few years in their window with all the money that they've spent, kind of time it up to where they're, they're ready to spend right when those two teams are kind of coming down and the, the, the payroll and wins. I think that's when yeah. Arizona makes their move the best. Yeah, I, I, I could see that. I, I don't know if there's ever going to be – like this year might have been the Dodgers down year, right? Like they, they didn't spend that much because, you know, we all are expecting they're going to save all their money and throw an ungodly amount of dollars at, at Shohei Otani next winter. But uh, so I, I don't know if you can ever expect the, the Dodgers to kind of like fade away. True. Maybe the Padres. We're all wondering how if the Padres can keep this up year after year after year, just handing out monster contract after monster contract. Um, I, I think if the Dynamax make a kind of a payroll move like that, it has to be based purely on where they are. Um, they've locked up Corbin Carroll, but they've got Jordan Lawler coming. They've got Gabriel Moreno already on the team. Um, they've got Drew Jones, you know, a few years after Lawler, probably. They've got a, a lot of these really like elite level young players. And a big kind of X factor is Zach Gallant. You know, he's in his first year of arbitration eligibility. He's got two more seasons after this one. He's a Scott Boris client. We all know how Scott Boris uh, clients don't tend to sign extensions. They like to hit the open market. But if you plug Zach Gallant off of this team, uh, it's a way different looking team. You know, they're still probably competitive, but he's the guy that makes them look like a playoff team right now. Uh, and if, if you don't have him, uh, Three years from now, uh, and none of these young pitchers have really established themselves as the next Zach Gallon. That's a big hole to fill. You're going to be spending some money to do it, no matter what. So uh, I, I do think that they've got to look at where they are, and you know they've got two and a half more seasons a gallon. Maybe they want to take advantage of that and make a push now. We've got about a minute left. I, I got two things I want to throw at you. One, and, and this is playing off what uh, one of our fans Riley said in the chat: least fan friendly ballpark. Maybe a reason they don't come to games. I mean, I'd beg to differ. I think least is pushing it. There's there's some other pretty shitty ballpark situations. I, I invite Riley to to hit up the trop and check out that freaking facility right now. But anyway, on that point, um, I, I didn't know the roof situation. I, I hadn't seen that. How how long does it take to fix a roof? And if it's costing you money, shouldn't people be there overnight yeah. getting that thing together? I, you would think so. Yeah, they found it before last season, before the 2022 season, which one argues like, why are you inspecting it? Like right before the season, why not do it in like October? So you have the whole off season to fix it, but it's a cable that pulls the roof open on one side that is stressed that they are worried that if they open it at full speed, it might snap and kill somebody. Mm. Uh, and so they have to open it at like five times slower speed. So it takes 20 minutes and they can only do it when no fans are in the ballpark. So they, what they used to do, and I actually wrote a story about it a couple of years ago, they have an original song that they would play when the roof opens that like makes it sound super majestic and stuff, and they do it right before first pitch. Um, and so they can't do that anymore. And so in May and in April, they've had it open a lot because they can open it during BP. It doesn't get too hot. But in June and July out here, they're just going to have to have the roof closed. And it's a, a, a much more charmless ballpark when the roof is closed. It's like playing in an airport hangar. When it's open, it actually feels like a baseball stadium. Mm -hmm. And last one, there's a lot of chatter right now from our fans about Geraldo Perdomo leading the team with a 161 OPS plus. There's a high batting average on balls in play. They're like, he needs to bat higher in the order and be playing every single day. Yes or no? Uh, in between. So they got Nick Ahmed, who's one of the best defensive shortstops in baseball. He's a veteran. He's in the last year of his deal. He has a role in this team. Also, I think if you look at, and I love Geraldo Perdomo. He's one of my guys. Um, but if you look at his, I think, uh, Baseball Savant page, there's a lot of blue on there. He's not, you know, an exit velocity superstar or something. He's always had a great feel for the strike zone, uh, just to really surveys that well. But he's always had trouble putting a charge in the ball. And so there's an argument that he's going to regress a little bit 
at some point. I still think he's a really good player, and I'm super pleased to see him having the season he is. It's pretty cool. Um, but, you know, he's not one of these guys that's hammering the ball like an average exit velocity of 95 or something, you know. Uh, he's got good back control. It's uh, it's good that he's getting past what, you know, in the past would be called a little bit of passivity at the plate, kind of letting hittable pitches go by because he's being such a perfectionist. But, um, you know, I think he had been batting like ninth for a long time, and I think they've scooted him up and up and up. Um, but, I mean, look at the guys ahead of him. Look at what Lourdes Gurriel's doing. And look at what Corbin Carroll's doing. Uh, look what Christian Walker's doing. Like, those guys have uh, a bit more of a track record, in, including Corbin Carroll for that matter. Um, and I, I wouldn't want to bump them down just to squeeze Perdomo up there. Nailed it. That's good stuff. Hey, Zach, great talking to you. And you can follow him at ZH Buchanan on Twitter. And of course, yeah, check that article out for more info on the Bumgarner situation behind the scenes. Thanks, Zach. Cheers, man. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Appreciate you. All right. So we'll run pretty quickly here through our last bit of biz. We got picks to do. So let's get to our BetMGM locks. For Tuesday, yesterday, we all went on plus money side with picks. First off, come on. (laughs) (laughs) Stop picking White Sox games to bet on. Dude, it was perfectly set up for them. We talked to Gavin Sheets. Gavin said hit five home runs in like two innings off of. Cleveland had a doubleheader and a late flight. Chicago's sitting there rested, ready to go. And you know what they went out and did? Scored zero runs. <laughs> zero runs. Kratz, do you have a scalpel? I'd like to use it to, to grab AJ's heart and take it out so that he can use his brain and not his heart for these picks. I need it. I need I need but AJ he, to pick the other way. That way when the Sox win, for, yeah. you win money-wise, or you lose money-wise, but you win in Thank your heart. Thank you. Hedge your damn game. But here's my thing. You're taking think about how Kratz. He, he, he's worse than me. Think about how rich you'd be if you went against, if you faded the White Sox all year. Just well, think about it. I wouldn't be it. that rich because the money lines would be so negative. And one time they win, I'd be like, <laughs> crap, I just lost all that that game. Fair, fair. <laughs> all right. And, and, and Kratz, he's Rangers lost to the Pirates. All right. So here we are. Kip making his fourth pick of the season on his fourth show here at two and one. Mm-hmm. Um, I got a nice dub from the Rocks yesterday. I'm, Marlon's going to start coming back down to earth. Jazz Chisholm and the turf toe offense is rough. Rockies get to him yesterday. So let's do our bet and jam locks for Tuesday. Kip, you're going to lead us off at, at two and one. What do you got? Uh, I'm going to take one of the hottest teams right now, the New York Mets. <laughs> dude, think about kissing ass, dude. Oh my god! Oh my this team goodness. is hot right now. Have you seen them lately? They are going to go money line. Something about them. They got hot. <laughs> we're going to go money line. Uh, I think it's minus one ten. We go for two hundred. Yep. The hottest team right now. Let's go Mets. So you're going two two twenty to laying down two twenty to win. To win. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. yep. Our our, our uh, book, bookkeeper keeping track of everything behind the scenes. Claudia just want to make sure she's got that down. Okay. And <laughs> Kratzy. I'm not even going to say anything other than I'm going Sunny Gray over six and a half strikeouts against the Gigantes. They got the Giants who are fourth in the league in strikeouts. So do it, Sunny. Do it. Gi- Giants are playing good ball right now, Dude, they too. struck out. I did the game last night. Yeah. They, both teams struck out so many damn times but, last night. But the Giants, what are they, won like seven of eight or something? Yeah, they're playing good right now. Yeah. But they, the, twins they, are, they, the Twins strike out a lot. The Twins are tops in the leagues. Giants are right on their heels. So mm-hmm. I expect a lot of punchies tonight. I think it was 20. They used an opener. Manaya had eight. I think it was 23 strikeouts between the relievers last night. Sometimes that changes the next day, though. That worries me. You got all the strikeouts out of the way the night before. You're you're picking on a prop, too? Ever since Cody Decker said you guys need to do more props. No, I just – you know what? I wanted to do a parlay, but Scott didn't teach me how to do it to build my own parlay. I can easily do that, but I was doing 80 things. I'm going Senga. Let's go Mets. Over six and a half Ks. How many with the ghost fork? Ghost fork me to death, baby. Mm-hmm. Because, how many of uh, those kids with the ghost fork? Five seven. Out of seven. 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 All seven of, of how many ever he gets. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Just as long as it's over six and a half. Yeah. But yeah, he's pitching in regularly. Mm-hmm. Cubs strike out a lot too, averaging over nine a game. So I think with him, ghost fork. Let's go Mets. Hundred to win one hundred and twenty. That's a plus one hundred and twenty pick, and I'm going plus money too. San Diego Padres. 
I got him wiping out the Washington Nationals tonight. I got Soto doing his best Freddie Freeman impression, being like, do you miss me now? The Padres eventually are going to turn it around and go on a run. And I don't just mean record-wise. I mean offensively. It's too good on paper to look like this. And this is the kind of series where you can look back and be like, holy shit, they swept them and outscored them. Also, I mean, the Nationals on the other end, they're not this good. Not that they have the best, a great record, but I think they're like a game apart, these two teams. So I could see San Diego handling business pretty easily in this series. So I think it starts tonight. And they've got Mackenzie Gore, who was in their organization. You can do some scouting there and you know the guy well. Darvish on the other side. Both have fresh bullpens. I like the Padres' bullpen better, obviously. So let's see what happens in that one. So can you teach me how to build a parlay? Because I also want to do Brian Easily. Bello over five and a half. K. Easily can angels. do a parlay before we get out of here. So okay. it's uh, bet 10, get a hundo instantly on BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android. Get it if you don't have it. Sign up and deposit at least $10 into your newly created account. Place a pregame Moneyline wager of at least $10 on any MLB team to win at standard odds price, and you'll receive 100 bucks in bonus bets instantly. And if you sign up in Massachusetts or Ohio, you'll receive $200 in bonus bets. Got to use the bonus code for your friends, Spicy MLB. And yes, I can absolutely teach you. I thought you knew how to do parlays already. You've done. Yeah, You've but done not. I know how to do a parlay in the same game, but I couldn't figure out how to do it in different games. Oh, in different games. Very yeah. easy. So okay. I got you. And let's slap hands. Kratzy, you do Kratz hats and you can jump. And then I just want to remind people about a couple shows that were released. So you go and then you split. Got the old school throwback Team USA hat. The first time. These were the BP Johns. They gave us t- double ones. It's like the, you know, with the underwear brim or the underwear stretch. So comfortable. Great for bald heads. <laughs> good to know. All elastic? right, looks good. Were you looking for the word elastic? No, no, underwear hats. It's like the elastic from the underwear. The, yeah. the flex, is, flex. Put it fit. in your hat. Yeah. Is it flex? Fit? I don't usually like to put underwear on my head, but when I do, <laughs> I put it in my Team USA hat. <laughs> Kratzy, you get out of here. Let me show a couple things that were released today. Uh, first off, yes, and we're going to announce the, the White Sox winner too. So somebody throw me that name that was just picked. But Brew Crew Territory uh, was released this morning. We spoke to Kurt Hogue of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel about the team's chances in the division and also if they should be buying or selling. And Corbin Burns, a conversation with him included in there as well on Brew Crew Territory. So you can get that right now wherever you get your podcast. Just type it into Apple, Spotify, whatever. And it is up on YouTube as well. So also Fair Territory is there for you. Ken Rosenthal's weekly show released. You can get it on Apple or Spotify and also on YouTube. So check those out as well. If you get a chance, good stuff on there. And lastly, are we ready for the giveaway? Before before we do this, before we give this ball away, I just want to say I have no idea who picked the winner, so don't be hating on me that I picked the wrong person. Because I don't know how You're Scott... You're not involved on that process at all. That's what I'm saying. I just want to make sure that's clear. <laughs> that I had it's nothing a, to do with it's this. It's a contest. It goes in a random generator. I, I, I actually I, learned about how that works. I, I understand that, but I just want people to understand that I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> I'm AJ Przinski, and I did not. I did not. I do not know how they picked the winner. Okay, we do have a winner of the signed clank ball by both AJ Przinski and Lance Lynn. It is authenticated. Release it. Everyone will learn together who the winner is. Kevin at K M D R K E V. Kevin Chuda. Winner, winner. Chuda. Congratulations, Kevin. Congrats, Kev. There you go, bud. Enjoy it. AJ gave it a, Wait, a few kisses hold today. On. <laughs> Tango's not pitching. All right, we'll oh, go back. Toasty, Can toasty. you not interrupt my... Sorry, my dude, that's away? breaking news. Uh, okay, well, I go will, ahead. I will Sorry, congratulations, Kevin. All right, I want Brian Bayo <laughs> over five and a half. I changed my Kevin, pick. congrats, though, dude. Um, we will uh, get in contact with you or vice versa. Social team will, will be on it, and we'll get the address, and we'll send that out to you. So do not put it up for sale in the first five minutes, at least. Keep that thing. Enjoy it and and maybe, you know, like wash off the side of it that doesn't have the signature because AJ AJ kissed it. Uh, okay, AJ, you wanna you wanna pick here what you got? Pick what? You got you got a repick, you said. I said who's Brian pick, Bayo. Who's, 
Who's pitching now for the Mets? Uh, I don't know. Now Kip has to change so his wait, pick. What yeah. happened? Sanger? I don't know. Toasty said McGill's pitching now. Oh, Tyler and McGill. Yeah. Do it now. Did Senga get scratched? Pushback. I don't know. Push Toasty. Back. Thanks, Toasty. I knew we were friends. Uh, I'm taking Brian Bayo over five and a half. At what? I don't know. I can tell you. Well, plus one twenty-five probably. Brian Bayo five and a half Ks plus a hundo to go over. Oh hell! Ah, still, I'll take it. Shouldn't that make you now? I want take... now I want Senga under tonight. Six and a half. <laughs> Tenga underplaying tonight. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's it for us. We will see everyone tomorrow, as usual, of course, on FT Live. Kip, good to see you, man. Thank you, gentlemen. Until next time. See you soon. Go Kode Senga tonight. He's going to have a great time watching tonight's game. I mean. Congrats, Kevin. <laughs>